wants their loved one to be the one, the statistic. I want to make preventable deaths history in our hospitals. I am passionate about zero. I am loving zero. I commit to zero. I'm imagining zero preventable maternal deaths. I am zeroing in on zero. I'm facilitating zero. Yo trabajo para zero. I'm dreaming of zero. I'm building to zero. Zero is an imperative. I'm praying for zero. I'm celebrating zero. I'm sprinting towards zero. I'm supporting zero. I am championing zero. I'm advocating for zero. And I'm legislating zero. I'm planning for zero. And I am pushing zero. 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 J'aime zero. Zero. We can do it. Zero. Zero! Welcome. Today is World Patient Safety Day. And for those of you who are not aware that we have a World Patient Safety Day, this is the second one, an annual event which was the initial idea of Mr. Jeremy Hunt, the previous British health minister, who's done so much for patient safety and has now been taken up by the World Health Organization and they're supporting it every year. I am Mike Ramsey, chairman of the board of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and I'll be one of your hosts to kick off our Unite for Safe Care virtual event. I'm also chairman of the anesthesia department at Baylor University Medical Center and a practicing anesthesiologist. The videos you just saw is a collection of interviews uh, from our previous meeting uh, last year in January from the many members of our organization whose families or friends had had patient safety issues and some of these videos are really very telling. As you get to know us, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, the organizers of Unite for Safe Care campaign, has been running for the last 10 days. You'll learn that we're a global nonprofit that is tired of inaction and believes that gathering like-minded people, passionate people, will help us reach our goal of zero preventable deaths even faster. Though we couldn't gather in person today, we have a phenomenal program for you. You'll hear from leaders who have been passionate about patient safety and healthcare worker safety for decades, and others who are thrown into caring about this issue because a tragedy affected them or their families or their loved ones. To open our show, here to join us is Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the World Health Organization to welcome us all to the second annual World Patient Safety Day. Dr. Tedros. Dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of WHO, I would like to extend our greetings to all the people joining the Unite for Safe Care campaign in honor of World Patient Safety Day. This year's focus is dedicated to the team of health worker safety which is a priority for patient safety. The COVID-19 pandemic highlights the serious difficulties health workers face around the world as they respond to this unprecedented public health challenge. Keeping our health workers safe makes us all safer. I would especially like to thank my friend Joe Kiani for his leadership as the founding chairman of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We're grateful to you, Joe, for your collaboration and partnership with WHO and for the generous donation by the Massimo Corporation to the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund and the WHO Foundation. In May 2019, uh, the World Health Assembly adopted a resolution calling for global action on patient safety and established World Patient Safety Day to be observed every year on the 17th of September. World Patient Safety Day calls for global solidarity and concerted action by all countries and international partners to improve uh, patient safety. Patient safety is at the heart of universal health coverage 
and the color orange is one of the signature colors of the Health for All uh, logo. The COVID-19 pandemic has unveiled the huge challenges and risks health workers face uh, as they do their work around the world. Uh, this include health care associated infections, uh, burnout and stress, violence uh, and stigma. Uh, some of these risks may lead to illness and even death, uh, as you know. Working in such uh, difficult conditions can have negative consequences for patients too, as health workers are more prone to making errors. The slogan for the World Patient Safety Day 2020 is clear. Safe health workers, safe patients. Uh, health worker safety and patient safety are two sides of uh, the same coin. As you know, every year millions of patients die or are injured due to adverse events as a result of unsafe health care. Most of these deaths and injuries are preventable. To ensure no one is left behind, it's, it's vital that we work together in solidarity. And WHO is working to bring together policymakers, health workers, uh, patients, and the public and private sectors uh, to improve patient safety. When errors do occur, it's, it's important that we learn from them so that we can prevent them uh, from happening again. By following best practices, uh, we can avoid harm to patients and health workers alike. Uh, patient safety and health worker safety is everybody's business. Thank you, Dr. Tedros for joining us today for the Unite for Safe Care virtual event. This is the first program of its kind, and we hope that you'll be inspired, laugh, be entertained, and perhaps even moved to tears, and that you'll become more educated about what you can do to improve patient safety and health care and ensure safer care for your family. This event would not have been possible without the generous support of our co-conveners, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, International Society of Quality in Healthcare, and the LeapFrog Group, who helped spread awareness of this program to their networks and encouraged many of you to be here today. And thank you for the long-standing support of our founding organization, the Massimo Foundation for Ethics, Innovation, and Competition in Healthcare, and our benefactor, Medtronic, for your continued support. And a huge thank you to our sponsors that are listed below. We want you also to help us remember those who have lost during these past months and celebrate those who have survived through the most incredible circumstances. For all of us, the pandemic has brought forth an important issue to the forefront of every media outlet in the planet. The healthcare system was broken before COVID-19 and became a household word, but now it's been stretched beyond relief. It's estimated that more than 200,000 people die of preventable errors in the US alone, uh, hospitals every year, and many more suffer from harm from these errors. How, now healthcare workers are getting sick and dying as well since we got hit with the pandemic. Healthcare worker safety is patient safety because without them, we cannot keep our patients safe. The good news is the system can be fixed if we all work together. Now COVID-19 is also getting close to that number of 200,000 preventable deaths. And this is really very concerning, but together we can beat it. We are beating it and we'll put this behind us and we'll learn a lot about it so that future pandemics will be much better prepared for. We conducted a poll in the midst of the pandemic at the end of April, and we discovered that most of you have never heard of the term medical error in fact, 79% of Americans don't know that the safety of patients is compromised every day in healthcare. So it's important that we begin our programming today with some history to give you 
some context into why this matters to you, to your family, to your friends. If you're shocked, you're not alone. Let's watch a video about Lewis Blackman that we recorded several years ago, but still as relevant today. Lewis was our oldest child. We have two children. He was really a, a live wire. He was a very lively boy. He was also quite brilliant. I mean, he was one of the most highly intelligent people I've ever known. And he learned a lot. He knew a lot of things, more than far more than most adults. So he had this sort of wide and varied knowledge. And he also had a wicked sense of humor. So he was, um, so other children really enjoyed him. He was just a fun kid. He had a condition called pectus excavata, which is um, a condition in which the breastbone doesn't really grow straight. It's just, it's a cosmetic condition. We saw an article in um, our local newspaper talking about this safe, minimally invasive new surgery. And we ended up taking our son for pectus surgery. And Lewis came out of surgery, and we thought, Phew, we've made it through that. About three days after surgery, he, he suddenly had this excruciating pain in his upper abdomen. He was prescribed a, a, a drug called Ketorolac Tordol, which is um, an NSAID pain reliever, like aspirin. He developed a perforated ulcer because he wasn't properly hydrated at the same time. And no one noticed. He declined for 30 hours and they dismissed it as uh, constipation. By the next morning, he had no blood pressure. He had um, sky-high pulse rate. He lost 2.8 liters of blood. And for a child size, I think you had had about four liters altogether. You know, I watched the, the the color drain out of his lips. It was just like water going down in a glass. And they turned the same color as his skin. Just all the all the pink left his lips. It's it's really hard to even imagine seeing something like that. And then he, you know, he, he said to me, it's, it's going black, and he, he went into cardiac arrest. Yeah, I ran out of the room. I thought he was having a seizure. I ran out of the room looking for help. These young residents and nurses were just astonished, and they worked on him for about an hour and a half before they gave up but uh, they never could bring him around. Losing Lewis has been devastating. I started Mothers Against Medical Error. When we came back from, from the hospital, the first thing we did was the legislation, the Lewis Blackman Act. So one of the things that we have tried to work on is you know, full disclosure informed consent, transparency, badges, labeling of people because we had been misled about who was a resident and who was a doctor, and rapid response having an emergency number for people to call and allowing people to call their doctors as well. So those were four things that had come directly from our case that, um, you know, that we had seen that we thought we could fix with legislation. Lewis was monitored, but it kept alarming and they would keep setting it lower and lower. And finally they had it down at 85 and he, it still kept alarming, so they turned it off. Every patient deserves continuous monitoring. You, you never know 
what's going to happen, particularly with post-operative patients. Um, Lewis is a prime example. He was a perfectly healthy child, which is why no one believed that he could possibly have anything wrong with him. So you need a, um, an objective observer like a monitor. My name is Jake Lyon, and I'll be one of your co-hosts for today's Unite for Safe Care virtual event. Hearing Lewis Blackman's story really highlights to me the life or death stakes of the patient safety movement. Lewis would have been 29 this year, and frankly, I can only imagine the burden that his family carries while working to spare others from that same tragic fate. My own father, who is the filmmaker who helped share this story with the world, has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease for almost a decade. Right now, I just feel lucky that he was spared a disastrous medical error. Ultimately, though, this ought not be a matter of luck. This is a public and human rights issue. We want a future in which a medical emergency or a need for long-term care does not bankrupt us. We want health care that we can trust to be safe and that puts patients first over financial profits. In this opening segment on the history of medical error, You'll hear from health workers, administrators, public figures, and family members who have lived through preventable medical errors. This first segment is to help you understand why we're all uniting for safe care today. I was blown away by what Mike Ramsey said. Nearly 79% of Americans don't know that the safety of patients is compromised every day in healthcare. Now, let's hear from Danielle Ofri. So many of us are familiar with uh... Peter Pronovost's very famous uh, intervention on catheter-related infections when he came up with the five-item checklist. Very simple, you know, make sure the, the, the area is sterile, use sterile gowns, use sterile dressings, not rocket science, and yet the infection rate plummeted almost to zero. But 135 years earlier, Florence Nightingale did almost the same thing with almost the same steps. She'd used the words clean, where he used sterile, but in fact, her rules for making medical care safer were the same. Make sure the patient is wearing clean clothing. Make sure the, the nurse or the doctor is wearing clean clothing. Clean the wound, wash your hands, put a clean dressing on. And when she showed up in, um, in the 1850s to the Skatari uh, British Army Hospital in the Ottoman Empire, four times as many patients, four times as many people were dying of, when she came to the military hospital in the Scutari region of the Ottoman Empire, four times as many people were dying of infection and disease than were dying on the battlefield. And so she began, the first thing she did was to rigorously collect data. Where were the deaths happening? Where was food being prepared? Where was waste being removed? Who was taking care of the patients? Uh, what were they wearing? What were they doing? Now, of course, she drove her supervisors crazy because she took all this time to get all this meticulous data. But in fact, she showed, as did Peter Pronovost a century plus later, that if you don't measure where the problems are, you'll never figure out what's going on and how to fix it. And within a year, her mortality rate at her hospital plummeted from something like 33% down to 4%. Just by measuring where the problems are, making an intervention, making simple rules, um, and then measuring the outcome. And, and I look at Florence Nightingale as really the patron saint of the patient safety movement. We think of her mainly um, as a nurse and the beginning of professional nursing. And in fact, this year, 2020, is the 100th anniversary of her birth. And so the WHO has made 2020 the year of the nurse, and rightly so. But we should also think of Florence Nightingale as our first patient safety expert, our first biostatistician who recognized that in order to make healthcare, to make medical care safer, we need to measure what's going on. As you can see, I've traveled all the way to Sydney, Australia to introduce our next speaker. Please welcome our good friend, Peter Lachman, the Chief Executive Officer of the International Society for Quality in Healthcare. I'm very proud that ISCRA is the co-convener 
for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation virtual event, Unite for Safe Care. If we can come together to deliver safe care, then we can make a real difference for people uh, in healthcare and for those receiving care. I believe that patient safety is a social movement and a public health issue that will require a united response by all of those. We have to learn from the people who deliver care and the people who receive care on how to be safe. ISCRA is very pleased that together with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, we are making a difference in bringing awareness to the importance of patient safety, as well as the importance of a united spot response to this growing problem. We look forward to being with you during this virtual conference and hope you have a good a learning experience with all the excellent speakers that are going to be there. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is John James. I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, I've retired from NASA now six years and presently I'm a patient safety activist. I've been asked to address the question, what does the public need to know about the last 20 years of patient safety work? Here's the way I see it through my knot hole. In 2000, the IOM published a study called To Air is Human in which they estimated up to 98,000 people die as a result of medical errors in hospitals. What you should know is that that study was based on medical records from 1984 and that it is generally irrelevant to mistakes made these days. A couple years later in 2002, my 19-year-old son Alex, a st been a st student at Baylor University, died from multiple medical errors. Specifically, a uh, guideline for potassium replacement was not applied to his care. His uh, diagnosis of long QT syndrome was missed and his uh, doctors never warned him not to return to running. He had collapsed while running. Um, his discharge instructions showed only don't drive for 24 hours. Even in his follow-up visit, he was not warned not to run. Three weeks later, he died on the Baylor University campus while running. Later, I found out that his cardiac MRI was never properly done, and I found that his medical records had been falsified. I asked the Texas Medical Board to look at his medical records, and they deemed that his care met the standard of care in Texas, and I was outraged and appealed. They returned with a conclusion that actually his care exceeded the standard. What you need to know as a patient is that the standard of care may be well unhinged from evidence-based, that is the best, medicine. And two, state medical boards are going to favor uh, physicians over patients who complain. In 2003, a global trigger tool was developed by the Institute of Medicine and it was able to find far more preventable adverse events than direct physician review had revealed. From 2008 to 2011, four credible studies were done in which that tool was used, and uh, many uh, deaths were recorded as a result of preventable adverse events. There is a better way to find medical uh, errors. In 2013, uh, based on the studies I just mentioned, I published a review in the Journal of Patient Safety in which I estimated that between 200 and 400,000 people died prematurely as a result of mistakes made during hospitalization. That does not mean they die during hospitalization. Often, death occurs long after hospitalization. These may be errors of omission, such as in my son's care to omit potassium replacement. Know that we, hospitals are not as safe as we like and that mistakes happening there may not occur before discharge. In 2015, I co-edited a book called The Truth About Big Medicine. The themes there included medical board failures, secrets of the National Practitioner Data Bank, problems with efficient physician peer review, dangerous medical drugs and devices, problems with medical imaging, and so on and so on. What you need to know as a patient in the USA is that there are many ways that healthcare can lead to harm to you. I became frustrated and in 2017, I turned my attention more to empowering patients than to trying to fix the system. My focus was on informed consent, which is what is sought by a reasonable patient in about half the states in the U.S. In 2019, two colleagues and I published a study in BMJ Open in which we asked around the country through survey what patients wanted to know before an invasive procedure was done on them. What they wanted to know was far more than is normally included in informed consent. To reinforce that, a study in 2020 showed that informed consent documentation in 25 hospitals 
average less than five quality points out of 20. What you need to know as a patient is that your power is in getting informed consent. So know how to do this, insist on it, insist on clear, crisp answers to your questions. Do your homework, know your questions, get safe care. Godspeed. Healthcare has developed in complexity and is prone to human error in the delivery of care. Medic, uh, medical issues have uh, become more difficult to deliver and we have to develop systems that can decrease the harm to people and protect people who receive care. Part of this is working through uh, the, the lens of human factors and to understand how work is done and then to develop reliable systems and processes to ensure that work care is delivered in a safe, person-centered way. Parts of our services need to be highly reliable in that they have to be standardized so that people get the right care every time. And others, you need to have to adapt rapidly to changing circumstances, such as we've had in the recent COVID uh, pandemic. But at all times, patient safety must be central and risk must be proactively managed. There's much we can learn from each other. And I think that if we understand that medical error can be reduced and can be mitigated against, then we can make a real difference. I've been asked to explain what a high reliability organization is. And that's an organization where if you make an error, this error could be lethal. Think about nuclear power stations. Think about flying planes off an aircraft carrier. Think about healthcare. And what is a high reliability organization? That's where the correct safe path has been plotted and then everybody involved in that industry knows their roles. They have practiced it. They have gone through it many times. If there is an error, it's drilled down to so it can't happen again. Every plane taking off that aircraft carrier takes off and lands safely. The nuclear power station, except for one we can remember from years ago, are safe. Healthcare system must be safe. There's a correct protocol to doing something. We call them apps. These are the best practices that have come from the safest hospitals across the world. And we have them online, we have them published online, and if every hospital were to follow those apps, we would have a very safe healthcare system. And so that would what a high reliability organization is. You know you can go into that organization. You know that the right practices will be done. You know that you'll be safe. And that's where we have to get our healthcare system to. Thank you. My name is Dr. Tim McDonald, and I'm the Chief Patient Safety and Risk Officer at RL Datix. Prior to joining RL Datix, I practiced the anesthesia and engaged in patient safety activities for more than 30 years. And my passion has been helping organizations shatter the wall of silence. That is what too often happens when harm occurs in healthcare. I was proud to be one of the architects of the Candor Toolkit that's aimed at shattering that wall. The Candor Toolkit was supported and funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And it stands for communication and optimal resolution. And it's a process for, for normalizing compassionate honesty when we respond to, when we learn from, and we improve after harm. Now more than ever, the world is facing an empathy and compassion crisis with patients and families, the loved ones, and members of the care team suffering from the preventable harm that is occurring due to the ravages of COVID-19. And this is harm that is befalling both the patients as well as members of the healthcare team. Candor is the antidote for the compassion crisis by ensuring that we support one another and we learn from these events in a way that we can and we will prevent them in the future. Without transparency, we are doomed to repeat the problems of the past. As Sir Liam Donaldson has said, to err is human, to cover up is unforgivable, but to fail to learn is inexcusable. 
the hospital and the surgeon uh, were as transparent as I can imagine anybody could be. Um, I often tell folks that uh, the surgeon is the the poster child of what a, a good doctor should be. Um, you know, he not only notified Teresa out in the waiting room that things weren't going as they had hoped, uh, but within less than 24 hours, he was in the ICU and spoke to me about what happened and that he was accepting full responsibility for it. And within the next 48 hours, um, the president of the hospital visited me and once again informed me that um, they were taking full responsibility and that whatever I needed, all I had to do was ask. And that type of um, response um, from the, both the hospital and the, and the doctor just made me feel so much better that I had so many fewer things to worry about. Um, you know, I had plenty of time to lay there and think my head still worked okay. Um, but knowing that I was now paralyzed from at that point to neck down, that who was going to take care of the family? Who was going to handle my care? Um, how was I going to get better? And Med, the MedStar, the, uh, or the hospital, and their staff were just, I mean, I can't say it any other way than outstanding in their transparency with me. It's with great honor to introduce Jeremy Hunt today to our program. Jeremy Hunt has been the longest Secretary of Health of the United Kingdom ever and gave up the post to take on even greater responsibility for the UK. But during his tenure, he accomplished so much. He brought transparency to the NHS system which is the beginning of understanding the problems and solving the problems, and it has already paid numerous dividends. In addition, Secretary Hunt founded the Ministerial Patient Safety uh, Summit that has uh, been going on for the last four years, very successfully bringing the attention of world leaders to patient safety. We are blessed to have his strategic thinking, his care for humanity, and his incredible uh, presence and importance on the world stage to be focused on what we all care so much about, which is keeping patients safe. So without further ado, uh, Jeremy Hunt. Thank you. The World Health Organization say we have five preventable deaths every minute across the world, 2.6 million deaths every year. And why is it after 20 years of campaigning on this that we still have these terrible statistics? Well, the truth is that we need to change the law because when a tragedy happens in hospital, unlike in other fields of life, very often, sadly, someone dies. And then a defensive culture kicks in, which makes it impossible for doctors, nurses, midwives, other professionals to speak openly and honestly about what went wrong so that lessons can be learned. We have the lawyers, the regulators, the hospital authorities. Doctors are worried about being struck off the register, about being sued about the reputation of their unit, their professional reputation. All these things crowd out the most important thing of all, which is to learn from what went wrong and make sure it never happens again. What is still missing 
despite all this great academic effort, professional effort that healthcare industry is really paying attention uh, and giving a lot of uh, credit and importance to the concept of safety culture. There are other industries like nuclear power, aviation, that they have had a lot of advances in safety culture that I suggest that the healthcare industry, they should learn from that. In fact, this concept of safety culture or other one human factors, these are cross-cutting issues. These different industries, they need to learn from each other and to apply that. Again, uh, unfortunately, this uh, uh, mindset of silos has uh, hindered the improvement of safety in several of these industries. I hope that one day all these industries, nuclear, medical, and uh, aviation, they come together and to come up with uh, some joint statement and joint uh, initiatives on safety culture improvement. For 20 years, the LeapFrog Group has published critical patient safety and quality data so that the public can have access to transparent information about the safety of their healthcare systems. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Leah Binder, President and CEO of the LeapFrog Group. We are very proud to be part of the Unite for Safe Care movement today. This is so important to our country. Patient safety has been a problem for many years, and unfortunately, too often, it's treated with silence. People don't talk about the problem or we think it's maybe a secondary priority. It's a, it's a major priority. Experts suggest that as many as 500 people a day die from preventable errors and accidents in the healthcare system. Nobody wants this to happen. And there are ways to make it stop. And it's so exciting to be working with doctors and nurses, as well as patients and advocates, and our own constituency of purchasers and employers who really care deeply and know that we can do better in this country. So it's just thrilled to work with alongside all of our colleagues and friends to unite for safe care. Thank you. In 2013, we traveled as McKenna Lee and the Microfixers to the initial summit as musicians. We also participated in the summit and realized that we could leverage our rank and role in our respective healthcare institutions to support the initiatives of the patient safety movement. Subsequently, we became participants in steering committees and ultimately board positions as well as positions on steering committees and developed the app, the Patient Aider, which we donated to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So at the very first summit, um, one of the things that was a big uh, impact on me were the words that Joe Chiani um, used in one of his speeches, and that was about the little things that we do that can make a huge difference. Um, and about four years after that first summit, we decided as a band that we wanted to do something a little bit more impactful. We wanted to do something, you know, other than just pro providing music, we wanted to provide an actual song that would embody the spirit of the movement. And so, hearkening back to that first summit um, and those words that really inspired me, uh, we came up with a song called Little Things. And um, this song is basically meant to capture that whole spirit, that the whole spirit of how little things that we do can make a huge difference. to believe everything would be fine just lucky enough to be right there are times we leave all we know in the hands of an everyday hero and it won't take luck it won't take a miracle but the smallest thing
One voice and one choice and one chance To change a little thing Trust and trust was hard But they saved his life Without a thought to this Cause it's just who they are and There are times We live all we know in the hands Of an everyday hero And it won't take luck The smallest thing can change the world As we all know it's little things Little things that change the world We all know it's little things That one voice, that one choice, that one chance To change a little thing Thank you for all of your generous donations to support the Unite for Safe Care campaign. Your tax-deductible donation will support the Patient Safety Movement Foundation's ability to continue to raise awareness about unsafe care. Today is just the beginning and the tip of the iceberg. If you would like to contribute, make a donation by texting UFSC to 44321 or use the Donate Now link on this page. I was just wowed by his mind. He was a meditator and meditated several hours a day. He got it in his head that he was going to meditate on this bench, which was kind of, I call it a perch. And I hear this you know, thud and I jump up and run over. His head didn't actually have an impact on the outside that was visible, it was on the inside. It created such a small bleed that it was hardly noticeable. The only reason I even knew is he was wearing shoes and there was a noise and I looked down and I said, honey, your left leg is dragging. And the doctor said, go to the hospital right away. They told us that he had a subdural hematoma. He went into surgery the next morning. They said it went well. They were very positive about it. We were in the hospital for 13 days and it felt like some things were clearly going well and other things were clearly not going well. We would report that, you know, he'd had another chest spell or his arm was numb again or he had pain. That was followed by what was later called a grand mal seizure. Uh, they ran test after test, more CT scans, a chest scan, I mean, all day for hours. And then 
Yogi Raj looked at me and said, it's happening again. And we get to ICU and the woman who's in charge of the room says that they think there's probably a blood clot. And she just said, this doesn't usually go well and he could die. I, I could tell that they were, yeah, they really, really wanted him to be okay. And he wasn't. A couple of months later, we got the autopsy report and I poured through it and I actually set up an interview with the doctor who performed the autopsy. And part of it was about, was the blood clot visible? Was this conclusive? And he said it was absolutely conclusive. This was a complication of hospitalization. It wasn't because of his original traumatic brain injury. A lot of the things we were reporting are, in fact, indicators of a DVT and a PE. It's the most common cause of preventable hospital death. In my mind, more could have been done for sure. Compression socks. He did have the electronic version of it during the surgery and that day when he came back into the ICU. But the next day he started PT, they came off and they never went back on again. So I don't think it was just not on my radar. I don't think it was on anybody's radar. I've, I've spoken about this with medical professionals and I hear the same thing every time. I'm really glad you didn't say what hospital it is because I'm gonna leave this room wondering if it could have been mine. I really miss him a lot. He was my angel when he was here and he's my angel now. That was a powerful video from Vonda. Wow. As we open up our next segment of the program, the video you just watched will help you understand why creating a culture of safety in healthcare is the keystone to improvement. There are always people behind the why and Yogi Raj is why. He's the one that I think about constantly. He died a preventable death and we can learn from it. The way I always think about it is, is if you don't have a culture of safety, building improvement projects to avoid medical errors, such as blood clots in Yogi Raj's case, infections, medication errors, etc., you're building those processes on top of a sandy foundation and long-term they won't be successful. Culture is essential and it serves as a solid foundation to build process improvement projects on top of to be successful. Yogi Raj's story gives us a real life glimpse into a health system that shut down when the family wanted answers. Now let's hear from Donna Prosser. Thanks, Ariana. You're so right. Without a culture of safety, we'll never be successful in eliminating harm from medical error. But in order to create a solid foundation for safe and reliable care, hospitals also need to establish a process for continuous improvement and to ensure that those improvements are sustained. But this is really hard work and many hospitals across the globe haven't yet been successful at this. But some are leading the pack and have truly begun to create lasting change in their organizations. Person and family-centered care is key to what we do. For decades, we have been a profession taking care of patients, and that's a mistake. What our obligation is, is to do no harm. And to do no harm, we must begin by focusing on who the person is and partnering with that person in their life and wellness. Persons and families can participate in care in the acute care setting and in all healthcare settings by asking why. Why, what, and how. Be inquisitive. Your physician, your nurse, your physical therapist is another person with a set of expertise that they're trying to use for you. You have the honor of making sure that what's happening is working for you. You and your family can participate in care by not only asking the questions, but being an active partner. All of us have an obligation 
to actively participate in our health and wellness. And by doing so, we assure zero harm ever occurs. One of the major challenges in patient and family engagement is the learned helplessness that's been socialized into patients for generations, uh, that our job basically is to comply and to follow directions. And I think patient and family engagement is a way to activate and claim that owner of our body's role in our care, whether it be at the bedside where we're being treated or as a volunteer in organizations that we rely on to deliver care. Uh, more and more hospitals are starting patient and family advisory councils or finding ways to put patients or family members on improvement teams or even on governing boards or committees that report to governing boards. And I think those are important transformation strategies. The, the culture changes when the voices in the room change. Another signal that this transformation is happening is the evolution in concept and language from patient-centered care increasingly to person-centered care or person and family-centered care. For me, that shift in language signals that systems are seeing with increased understanding that users of care are not fungible. We're not generic patients. We're not the ovarian cancer from Mound, Minnesota, which is how my mother's oncologist referred to her in my presence just before I fired that doctor. We're unique human beings with all the variation that comes with that uniqueness, and we need to be engaged as whole unique persons, not seen as just our patient role. To unite for safe care to me means I can fulfill a promise that I made when my husband died in 2012. He went into surgery, into the hospital for one reason, that was successful, but he died from a hospital-associated venous thromboembolism, a blood clot in the lung, and it happens too often to too many people. And we know that there are dozens of ways in which people die in hospitals or under medical care conditions, simply because safety is not prioritized as it needs to be. So to me, uniting for safe care is just putting safety at the top of the list, just like we would if we were going out on an airplane or a boat. It means that the clinicians that cared for my husband and all the clinicians that are caring for people today they get to go home knowing that they did their very best in a system that did its best to help them be safe in their medical care delivery. It means that patients and family members like myself come into those hospitals and healthcare institutions and clinics knowing that we have a role to play. And to the extent that we possibly can, we're asking questions, we're engaged. We are united with clinicians and clinicians are united with us and we are in systems that have prioritized safety through and through from the planning of care to the delivery of care to the follow-up of care and when we get that right across the globe when we are prioritizing safety at the top of the list and then all the other very important things we will begin to see that the errors we notice are quickly learned from, disseminated broadly, and that we are in a constant learning cycle, and that we do not see the perpetuation of harm over and over again, simply because we're not speaking up. To unite for safe care means to speak up. It means to say what we know so that we can begin to count these errors and these harms with each other no matter what role we have to play in that medical delivery of care or that medical receiving of care. It means that we have one goal in mind and that is to be safe while we are taking care of ourselves. So what can you do to make your care safer? Well, in my opinion, the most important thing you can do is to learn as much as you can. If you have the means to do it, Research your symptoms before you go to the doctor. Figure out what you think you might have and what you're most worried about. This lets you ask informed questions and have an informed conversation with your doctor. You'll be surprised how much this can change the dynamic. Know the symptoms to watch out for in case something goes wrong and how to contact your provider if it does. If you have a complex condition, Keep an up-to-date copy of your medical record and take it with you to medical visits. 
it's very likely that your copy will be the most complete one anyone has. You are the keeper of your care. And if you see a problem in your care, report it to the facility or on the patient survey you might receive. You won't always see action, but healthcare systems pay attention to what their patients think, and they can't fix what they don't know about. When I have to go to the hospital um, as uh, uh, usually a caregiver for a, a patient, because I would probably have my own caregiver if I had to be hospitalized myself. But when I go, I think of myself as a driver of a car. And when you're a driver of a car, you know that you're not guaranteed uh, a safe experience. You have to be careful. You've got to do your job to um, look at look both ways at intersections, be alert for risk, check your mirrors to see what's happening around you, and, and drive with just sort of a heightened awareness that there could be some variable, some vector that could happen at any time that you're going to have to manage to avoid an accident. And that's how I approach being a family advocate. And it, it, it gives me confidence that my job is to speak up and, that I, and not to be intimidated, to, to report things, to point out things that can be improved, even if it's an awkward conversation. Um, and I hope that's a useful concept for you. It really has helped me in my role as a, as a, um, as a family caregiver. Um, I think the challenge now is to is with COVID that we now have to be doing that increasingly by phone or FaceTime, and we're all figuring out how to do that. Uh, but it is still, we'll figure it out. I mean, it's a useful concept to me, and I hope it is to you. Thanks so much. It's been my pleasure to offer these thoughts to you uh, today at this important conference. Around the year 2000, the Institute of Medicine published a, really a seminal text called To Air is Human. And that brought to life what was going on in the hospitals where we had so many medical errors that caused a lot of morbidity and mortality. And Chalk took this very seriously from the very beginning. And now we have committed a lot of technology to decrease errors. The most meaningful thing we've done is eliminate serious harm by 95% in the last eight years. We have reduced the number of codes or resuscitations by 85%. Most importantly, it's stayed low for the nine years since. There's a blame-free community, and we encourage the reporting of errors and even near errors because we want to learn from our mistakes. We want to learn from our near mistakes to make sure that it doesn't happen again. But transparency drives results because once you know what's happening, then things begin to change. At this hospital these days on our what we call communication boards, you actually can see patient results that are up to date and available for all to look at. And when you're in a hospital, that all includes your parents and or patients. That's a very powerful motivator for wanting to get better. Here at Chalk, we really strive to practice patient family-centered care. We do that in a variety of ways. Of course, the parent can provide feedback. And if you're willing to accept that, you're willing to say, hey, we're experts, but you know your child best, then you can go a long way towards really understanding the, the gist of the problem. We've instituted for the physicians peer review. So to have a you know, multidisciplinary peer review process is really informative for the physicians. Those of us that went to medical school some years ago, we did not learn about collaboration. Team approaches were not encouraged. And now we know that we need to teach team approach. We need to teach collaboration because that's how you're gonna improve communication. I'm excited about what we're doing, but I'm very focused on what else we need to do to continue to improve. Being a safe organization, if you consider yourself one, you're almost certainly wrong because it's a journey. You're never there. All we can do is try to have a, a, a society, a culture within the organization that reports things that could be better. It's willing to learn from itself. It is a culture that has justice inherently in it. And lastly, it's flexible at times of stress. If you can do those things, then you'll be more likely to be an informed culture. And an informed culture is as safe as we can be. That's how you make change. The patient safety movement has done a great job of promoting the, the zero concept. Well, I think getting to zero is great, and that's where we want to be, and that's where we expect to be. So it's just a continual drive to make sure we stay there.
and he requires every single individual, starting from our board directors, which they are amazingly supportive, and from the physicians, really all the way down to the individuals working in the kitchen and, and taking care of the room. Everybody has bought into their part of getting to zero. It's not one person, it's every single individual, and it also will include the parents and, and the patients. You know, I'm really proud of our organization and I'm uh, so pleased with the successes that we're having. It's, it's a journey and we've honestly been at this for decades. I'm positive that if all of us commit to that and we work well together within our ecosystem, we'll get there. I'm, I'm absolutely certain it can be done. The leadership at Chalk understands that creating reliable systems means not relying on human beings to be the safety net that prevents errors from harming people. Lucian Leap, who was an early pioneer in patient safety, once said, the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. We have to put system processes into place that provide a better safety net. Today, across the world, more and more doctors, nurses, and healthcare providers are using computers to support the delivery of care. And they're using what are called electronic health records or, e or EHRs. These EHRs have replaced the paper records that existed in the past. And there are tremendous, tremendous benefits to electronic health records. EHRs allow care providers to order medications faster than they ever could before allows them to access information about the patient that they weren't able to access as easily before. There are new rules developed into the computer system, into the EHR, that make it so certain errors are unlikely to happen anymore. There's so many benefits, in fact, that if you ask many clinicians whether they'd want to go back to paper, many of them say no, they'd like to continue using the electronic health record. However, there are some challenges with this technology. And one of the biggest ones has to do with the usability of the technology. Now, what do we mean when we say usability? Usability is essentially the ease at which the technology can be used. And we measure it by looking at effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. The big challenge with electronic health records is the technology really has not been designed for the intended users which are clinicians and patients. And that actually has two major consequences. The first is that it leads to a tremendous amount of frustration for our clinicians and patients. And this isn't the kind of little frustration that comes when we're using our phone and can't figure something out. This is really big frustration because it takes clinicians a longer time to do the work that they need to do. And in fact, the frustration that clinicians are feeling from this contributes to this really big global problem of health worker burnout. And those frustrated healthcare workers and clinicians no longer want to be in medicine. And in fact, sometimes things have gotten so bad that they commit su suicide. The other major consequence of poor electronic health record usability is that it can lead to certain kinds of errors, just like the one that I described at the very beginning. And those aren't the only kinds of errors. Some of the other errors that come from electronic health record usability are things like an unbelievably confusing display of information where a critical lab result is missed for a patient. And now that patient is discharged when in fact the diagnosis is serious if the doctor could actually see that critical test result. Or a doctor selecting the wrong patient from a list of patients and then ordering a medication and a diagnostic test like an x-ray or even a procedure under the wrong patient. And then that patient receives that care that was never intended for them. These kinds of mistakes and errors that are facilitated by poor electronic health record usability happen all the time. And we need to do something to prevent these. And it doesn't just happen to adults, it happens to adults and children. The good news is there's a lot that we can do right now to improve EHRs. First, what you can do 
is when you're receiving care, you can pay very close attention to the care that you're receiving. Pay attention to the medications that are being ordered for you. Pay attention to the diagnostic tests and the procedures and make sure that those are really intended for you. The second thing that you can do is carefully review all of the information in your record. Check the basic descriptive information like your height and your weight, your age, and even your name to make sure that that's really your record. And certainly carefully look over all of the medical information. I have the greatest honor today to introduce the president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, a co-convener of today's conference. And this is Mary Dale Peterson. She is executive officer and chief operating officer of Driscoll Health System in Corpus Christi, Texas, as well as leading the major organization in the world of anesthesiologists, the ASA. They have over 53,000 physicians as members. And the priority of the ASA has always been patient safety. Back in the 70s, one in 10,000 patients died as a direct result of anesthesia. Now, with the major work done by the American Society of Anesthesiologists, that number is less than one in 400,000. And now we will take on the sickest patients and put them under anesthesia so that they can receive surgical treatment. This is a major result of the work of the ASA and so we're great, very thankful today that Mary Dale Peterson can join us and uh, help this movement to reduce preventable patient harm and preventable patient deaths uh, in the globe today. Mary Dale Peterson, thank you so much for joining us. I think one thing is really giving feedback. And I think both positive and negative feedback can be helpful um, to a physician, um, their staff, as well as hospitals. You know, we are all into patient satisfaction surveys now. And I think, you know, we can, we can all help the healthcare system get better. Um, many hospitals also have focus groups or um, advocacy groups that patients can be a part of. And so I think that is another avenue where, you know, your experience, whether it's good or bad or a combination of those, which is more likely the case, um, can be used to um, help make the system of care um, better. I think your voice is very important in improving care. Um, and I think you have great ideas and sometimes um, we need to hear those to make those types of improvements in our systems of care. It's no secret that the current norms of patient care are absolutely unacceptable. Healthcare has become a system of deep compromise and patients and caregivers are all paying the price, literally, figuratively, physically, financially, emotionally. And I personally don't see any of this getting much better in the short term in the age of COVID-19. Now, having said that and speaking from deep experience, I think there are several very practical things we can all do to help ensure better care when we find ourselves and or our loved ones in the hospital, especially in the age of COVID. The first thing, always at the top for me, is always have an advocate. Someone to ask questions on your behalf and to remember that no question is stupid. Now, when you're sick, you're in no condition to be the best advocate for yourself. So you need someone, anyone, to be your wingman, wingwoman, sidekick, trusted consigliere. Write the questions down beforehand and ask them. When you think of them, write them down and then ask them. Your questions will force healthcare providers to think a bit harder on the care they're providing. It's win-win for everybody. Now, if they get mad at you because they're, they're busy or overworked or understaffed or just, you know, it's too much sensory overload, tough. All the more reason for you to stay on it. Two, the second one to me is get a second opinion. Great doctors and hospitals always welcome second opinions. Second opinions force good medicine, stronger diagnoses, challenge doctors to think a bit harder on difficult cases. Second opinions are great teaching moments for doctors and patients alike. 
Now, full disclosure, I had not one, but two second opinions for my triple hemorrhoidectomy cedar sinai ass surgery years ago, and I'm glad I did. And let me tell you something, so was my ass. Three would be to shop for your doctors, hospitals, and healthcare providers. We shop for everything else, cars, houses, phones, big screen TVs. Why not shop for your healthcare? Is there anything more important? Think about this, except for healthcare, in no other situation do we buy stuff without asking the price. That's insanity gone mad. Do not be afraid to shop like your life depends on it, because it does. Lastly, follow your gut. Yes, do all the research, ask all the questions, have your hero advocate, get second opinion, shop for your healthcare. But in my experience, always follow your gut. Your head will tell you one thing, your heart will tell you another. Both are critically important, but the gut does not lie. Now, I wake up an optimist and go to bed a pessimist every day, so you're catching me at a good time because it's morning where I'm recording this. But I really do believe there is hope for healthcare. I know it's such a cliche, and it's probably why cliches are cliches, which is also a cliche, but we really are all in this together. And if COVID-19 doesn't prove that, I'm telling you, nothing will. But in my humble opinion, it's not just wanting healthcare to get better. We need to need healthcare to get better. We need to demand it, and that's when real change will happen. We all need to look out for each other. You're counting on me. I'm counting on you. No pressure. Don't blow it. Good luck to all of us and everything. Thanks. Well, as far as staying safe, it's the same thing you've been hearing over and over again, and that is uh, physical distancing, not necessarily social distancing, but physical distancing from other people, uh, wearing a mask when you can't appropriately physically distance, um, you know, as well as, of course, washing your hands frequently. Um, those are really the mainstays of, you know, staying safe. The other thing that I think is, is worthy of discussion is this is a time I think that people can refocus um, on healthy habits in general. Um, and that is making sure your blood pressure and your diabetes are well controlled. I mean, this is the time to redouble your efforts in a healthy diet. Um, and exercise, which can also protect our mental health during these trying times. What can people do? Educate themselves, educate your children, wear the mask, keep the distance, wash your hands. These preventative measures work. Now, that keeps you hopefully safe and healthy and out of the hospital. Once um, people become sick, then have a plan. Have a plan, but put someone in a room in your house alone, give them food so you're not exposed, but keep them going. So uh, it's a simple, it, I know it sounds simple, but it's a, and it's a lot for people working with children and things going on every day. But yes, think these things through and have a plan of action. I'm currently working with frontline nurses who on a daily basis work in a complex healthcare system pre-COVID. Now that we are in COVID, it is really a disaster. Let me explain why pre-COVID we had our concerns. Safety, safety has a lot to do with an ability to do the job. The nurses cannot effectively do their patient care work being short staffed. That was occurring before the COVID. Before we had the shortage of PPE, we had an, before we had a national crisis. We were in crisis prior to COVID in the healthcare system. So now we are asked as healthcare workers to not only make up for a dismantled system prior to COVID, but to go into a now war zone. My name is Dr. Jeff Brady and I serve as the director of the AHRQ Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety. We're part of the US Department of Health and Human Services. I want to thank Dr. David Mayer and the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for their work to keep patient safety at the top of our nation's list of priorities. I also want to acknowledge my colleagues in our healthcare workforce. Your dedication to the patients you care for in spite of many obstacles is an inspiration for us all. We must do all we can to ensure your safety. During the COVID-19 pandemic, 
we've all seen just how imposing these problems are. Whether it's healthcare-associated infections, medication errors, missed or delayed diagnoses, falls, pressure ulcers, or one of the many other harms that threaten patients, these events challenge even the most capable organizations and clinicians. They have the power to dramatically alter the lives of patients, families, and those who care for them. No one wants these adverse events to happen, and yet the tragedies still occur. Their impact stands in stark contrast to the healing that we all hope for and expect from healthcare. We all share the common cause of patient safety, but we also need to unite around common actions that will speed up the patient safety improvements that we all need and want. Don't forget to subscribe to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. To do that, just click the subscribe button below this video. The foundation is creating new content weekly to keep health workers and the public informed. As the content you hear today resonates with you, join the conversation on social media by using hashtag Unite for Safe Care. Fundación del Movimiento de Seguridad del Paciente. Tener este tipo de fundaciones nos ayuda a nosotros como pacientes, ya que la mayoría de las veces entramos a ciegas a un quirófano o por falta de conocimiento no sabemos a qué nos podemos enfrentar en cuanto a riesgos se refieren y esta fundación nos da pauta de conocer más, de poder preguntarle más a nuestros médicos y estar seguros de todos esos exámenes previos a realizarnos antes de entrar a una cirugía ya que solo nos conformamos con lo que el médico, en este caso el anestesiólogo, nos dice, solo nos da información general, pero no conocemos todo lo que esto conlleva. Aportar a las familias para que sepan cada procedimiento, ya que al fin de cuentas el familiar es el que se queda pendiente de su paciente antes y después de la cirugía. Desde una pequeña bacteria en cualquier parte del cuerpo hasta casos de negligencia médica, que muchos doctores no paran la cirugía cuando es debido. Muchos desconocemos el cómo proceder en caso de negligencia médica, qué hacer o a dónde ir. Y hablo por experiencia propia, por el caso tan sonado de mi tía, por el caso de mi padre que se quedó sin sangre en una cirugía, por el caso de mi hermana que sufrió una parálisis temporal por la anestesia, o por mi propio caso que tuve una cirugía sin realmente necesitarlo. Deseando que más y más personas sepan de esta fundación, yo, Damiana Villa, me uno a ella. Con mucho cariño cantaré esta canción que me recuerda mucho a mi papi, que él la canta bastante, espero, espero les guste. Sacrificada sin razón, sin un amor, no hay salvación. No me dejes de querer, te pido. No te vayas a ganar mi olvido. Sin razón, sin un amor, no hay salvación.
corazón sin un amor no hay salvación the relationship you develop with the patient is one of the most loving giving honest relationships you can have. That person has entrusted you. You've shared the worst and you share the best. I grew up wanting to be a nurse, never wanted to be anything else. I was probably three years out of nursing school and I was working in a cardiac intensive care unit. One of my patients had suffered a large heart attack and I was in our med room, which was open to our nurse's station. And I was laughing and talking with my coworkers and not really paying a lot of attention to what I was drawing up in the syringe. I went into her room and started injecting the medication. And one of the nurses from the um, desk called out and said, Gwen, look at your monitor. And her blood pressure had just plummeted. I looked down at my syringe and I realized I had double dosed her on this very powerful blood pressure medication. I was crying and the patient actually took my hand and comforted me and said, honey, everything will be okay. I'm standing there in the back of the room watching my teammates try to salvage a patient that I harmed. I had potentially killed another human being simply because I wasn't paying attention. It, it was one of the worst nights of my life. It's, I'll never forget it. We were able to stabilize her. Um, it took about four hours. Stayed there about six days, and then she did go home. I questioned whether I was fit to be a nurse. You know, was I morally fit to take care of other human beings if I could be so careless? So I went into grief counseling. I felt renewed. I felt like, okay, this is my fate to be not only a nurse, but a champion for patient safety. We built one of the first quality circles in my unit, and we looked at medication administration, how we care for patients, fatigue in nurses. And when a nurse made a mistake, we had a team that would talk with her. We experienced less errors. We developed more processes around checking, we built in redundancy into our systems that we didn't normally have. It took about three years to get all of that set up. She came back to our unit about six months later, um, and she was dying. Her heart was so damaged that it just could not sustain her. And I said, remember we in the hospital before? Uh, I'm the nurse that gave you too much medicine. And I said, I want to tell you how sorry I am, um, but I also want to tell you how much I learned. And she reached up and kind of cupped my hands in hers and said, honey, I told you it was going to be okay. And as long as you learned something, that was great. You know, her name was Shirley. And every time I start a new project, I think about Shirley. She has inspired me for a lot of my 30 years in nursing. I'd like to thank Gwen for sharing her story with us today. None of us go into healthcare to harm patients. We choose medicine so we could heal and support those in need. Like other high-risk industries, we need to find solutions that trap these errors before they cause harm to our patients. For the last five months, I have been walking across America to raise awareness of those who have lost their lives due to preventable medical harm, both patients and healthcare workers. I have now walked over 1,300 miles on sidewalks, trails, and paths 
on my way from San Diego, California to Jacksonville, Florida, and have logged in over 3.5 million steps. More than 500 people across the world are also walking and exercising in solidarity with our mission of achieving zero preventable deaths by the year 2030. Together, we have walked a collective total of over 6,000 miles, or the equivalent of walking twice around the world to bring awareness to the 200,000 people who die needlessly every year from preventable medical harm. If you'd like to see the real-time view into the miles we've walked together, click on the link below in the description. Dr. Dave Mayer is walking to each spring training park to bring awareness to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. My wife looked at me and said, you gotta be crazy. Every day that I walk, I walk in memory of a caregiver or a patient that's lost their lives due to preventable medical harm. I think people don't realize that healthcare preventable harm is the third leading cause of death in the United States. We need to improve the systems and processes to allow the workers at the front lines to do their job as best as they can. We need your support. I hope the video you just watched of my walk across America to all the Major League Baseball stadiums will encourage you to join our team and dedicate your steps to raising awareness about this important issue. Thank you. I would like to thank you for inviting me to this very important event when I'm going to talk about mental health and burnout uh, of health personnel. These problems are not unique to healthcare personnel. We are just human beings like all of you who are watching this and we have the same human reactions. The difference is of course that we are, we are caring for life and we know that if we don't go to work, lives are at stake, our colleagues will have extra workload and so on and we are trained and motivated to save patients. It's also interesting that some of the traits or the properties in human beings that make us more prone to being burnout are the same that attract us to becoming healthcare personnel, like uh, empathy, like feeling of obligations and, and responsibility and so on. But as mentioned, we are just human beings and nobody can go on forever without sleep, rest, um, food and exercise. But if we try to push our own borders, it can work for a while and then it doesn't work anymore. We try to, with coping strategies, it could be for instance that we have wishful thinking, we think that if we just work a little bit more, things will become better. Uh, it could be that we blame ourselves uh, for, uh, for not working hard enough, just work harder and so on. And some would even even use alcohol and, uh, and uh, drugs to, to get that rest and everybody understands that's not the solution. The symptoms could be emotional fatigue, we feel that small tasks are very, very uh, strenuous now. Uh, we could uh, get uh, detached from our work, even cynical. And also that even the smaller tasks are just so intensively hard to do. If it goes that far, it's really important that you are stopped to move on and move on. Because if it goes too far, too far, then you will be out of the business for a long time. It takes months to recover uh, and, and build yourself up from scratch, so to speak. And that's why we have an obligation to help each other, support each other, recognize the symptoms and, uh, and uh, make sure that people get that rest so they can come back sooner and being stronger and, and better carers for the longer term for their patients. We are normal human beings, react like normal human beings, but we really want to be there for all of you. Thank you. 
Hello, I'm Robin Simon, the producer and director of Do No Harm. It's a documentary film about the hidden epidemic of physician suicide and burnout and the link to medical errors. And it's an honor to participate in the United for Safe Care campaign. In 2014, someone sent me an op-ed piece from the New York Times about these two young doctors who jumped from the roofs of their hospitals within a week of each other. And I come from a family of physicians, so I was shocked. And it set me on a mission to not only find out why this was happening, but why no one was talking about it. And what I discovered was that physicians have a suicide rate almost twice that of the general population and a depression and burnout rate of about 50%. Now, these kinds of stats, if this happened in the airline industry, this would be considered a major crisis for air travel. But because of the stigma about mental health and potential financial liability, it's often swept under the rug. This problem even starts in medical training. One physician told me it's like a time bomb. You have these young medical students who are isolated, they're bullied, experience sexual harassment, in hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt so they can't quit, and then on top of that, they're sleep deprived. So I started to wonder, well, if physicians and medical students aren't able to function physically or mentally, what kind of care are we getting as patients? And when I was able to link the high rate of medical errors to physician suicide and depression, it was stunning. I mean, it's said to be over 250,000 preventable deaths due to medical errors. What we need is regulation. And that's why this campaign is so important, because it's bringing together policyholders, healthcare workers, and patients to push for change. What we need is an independent investigation, independent oversight, and legislation that protects healthcare workers, that allows them to get the mental health care that they need, and also reduce the number of medical mistakes. So, the film is being used across the country to open a dialogue at medical schools and hospitals about what to do. And talking about it is the first step. If you'd like to get involved, what we need to do is keep the pressure on and make sure it's a priority for this country. Lives depend on it. For more information about the film, you can visit www.donoharmfilm.com, and it's also available on Amazon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. The COVID-19 pandemic was and is challenging in multiple ways. Personally, one of the hardest things was caring for patients in critical conditions while their family members were not allowed inside the ER. It is really hard to imagine the fear these patients must have gone through. I. I remember a 32-year-old female who was about to be intubated due to respiratory distress. And shortly before that, she asked me to step outside and talk to her husband. I quickly went outside to look for him and explain him what was happening. This event really marked me and reminded me that behind every case or patient, there are lives, humans, families. I would say that the early scientific uncertainty was probably one of the most difficult obstacles in the pandemic. We as medical professionals are used to acting with some degree of knowledge, especially in this era of evidence-based medicine. But we have to remember that at the beginning, we didn't know much. All we knew was that this was almost an exclusive respiratory illness. It was later on that we started to understand about the damaging effects of COVID 19 in the coagulation, the cardiovascular, and central nervous system. Patients felt frustrated, and understandably so, about not having any answers as to why this disease was causing multiple problems in their family members, loved ones. Our safety is your safety. Right now, we live in a continuum where society and the healthcare system are inextricably intertwined. My biggest plea for the public is to share scientifically accurate information. 
Fake news, as you know, are rampant. But if we work together, we can stop this trend. You can help us tremendously by amplifying the voices of the scientific and medical community. We can definitely help each other. Being a pharmacist today is very different from what has been traditionally thought historically. Our roles are expanding globally and our important role is increasingly being recognized as patients' needs have become more chronic versus acute. Pharmacists are exceptionally underutilized resources for many patients. We have an abundance of knowledge, not only in medications, but in disease states, public health issues, and the understanding of patients' needs as we are the most frequently visited healthcare professionals in their lifetime. Patients can access community pharmacists at local pharmacies, but there are many pharmacists who practice outside of this setting, including hospitals, uh, drug companies, and some pharmacists have their own practices to counsel patients on many different areas, including nutrition, lifestyle coaches, and many others. It is very frustrating when we have to advocate for our own worth and value to get our points across. We are not recognized as providers in the United States uh, federally, and this limits us to getting access and tools, ac access to tools and resources to help patients appropriately. It is heartbreaking to watch patients suffer with loneliness in the pandemic while at their deathbed. Although I myself haven't had a chance to be like a guardian when patients die, many nurses and other caring healthcare professionals have um, literally held their patients' hands. And I've been privileged to watch these while we attend codes which is a um, reviving effort of a team of pharmacists, nurses, doctors, and respiratory therapists working together. Suddenly, we couldn't really take care of patients the way we would normally do so. It was hard to speak. You're wearing three masks and a welder shield, and they're wearing masks, and the sound of the high-flow oxygen and the... Um, the ventilation system made it impossible to do all but the most basic of communication. And it's not enough just to give the patient the right treatment, the right oxygen, or the right antiviral medications. We also want to be taking care of them. And taking care of them is attending to all their needs and being able to talk with them, comfort them, answer their questions, explain the treatments. And we realized something we didn't have that at our disposal, how limited we are when we can't communicate the way they are. Uh, we can't communicate the way that we want to. And particularly, we saw this at end-of-life care. There were so many patients who died in the hospital, who died without their family, without their loved ones close by, without being able to communicate. And for us, the doctors, the nurses, the nurse aides, the technicians, the respiratory therapists who were with the patients at those moments, all we could do would be to hold their hand at best, talk to them as best we could and hear their final words. It's not the way we'd want to do it. It's not the way we want it for ourselves, for our family, or for all of our patients. I think we realized that in the absence of full communication, including touch, including listening and speaking, we really can't give the care we want to give. We can't give the quality care we want to give, and we can't give the safe care we want to give. And so, of course, we're all anxiously awaiting a vaccine so we can go back to giving medical care the way it should be, being able to attend to the details of observation, of communication, of touch, of nonverbal communication, to pick up on what's going on with the patient, what's happening medically, what's happening psychologically, what's happening spiritually, to be able to be there in all the dimensions for our patients. What I've seen so far is the fact that uh, in order for the public or us to be engaged in patient safety, it really comes down to the people who are cradling patient safety right now. And that would be the healthcare facilities, the healthcare management. They have to really think about opening the door and allowing the patients to come in. 
Uh, one of the facts that uh, is quite evident in patient safety and healthcare is the fact that according to the WHO, we are at about 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. And out of those 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, there are only 59 million healthcare workers. That's right, 59 million healthcare workers around the world. And you can check that up uh, on Google as well. Uh, it may have changed, but very, very slightly indeed. So when you're looking at 59 million people trying to take care of 7.7 .7 billion people, there is an absolute disconnect there. Uh, they can't take care of all of us and we can't expect them to take care of all of us. So what is important is to have healthcare facilities and healthcare management open their doors and allow the expertise to come in in non-clinical areas to assist them taking care of the rest of us. Now, there's many of us uh, who are constantly being trained and receiving other kinds of training in healthcare, but we do bring to the table as well our own expertise in our areas of work. Uh, mine, for instance, happens to be in communication. I'm sure there are many others who have different experiences as well. Um, I'm currently working with our patients around the world who have experience in safety measures in other industries that can help uh, healthcare as well. So my plea to healthcare professionals is to think about the help that we can give you and it is essential that we are able to do that on a regular and systematic way. So please do open the door because us patients, we are wanting to come and help you. So please enable us to be able to do this on a regular and systematic way. Thank you. Shalin was, you know, she was 22 and she was in school full time to become an RN. She had been recovering from a torn ACL in her leg. She had had an MRI done before she left, knowing that she was transitioning jobs. She drove 20 plus hours to get over on that leg injury. It wasn't severe at that point. But when she arrived, she kept on saying, look at my leg, mom, and all the time. Look, it's a different color and it's swollen. And when I left, I got a phone call from her. She was playing around and then she had fallen on that same leg. For her to be in as much pain as she was in, that was like, okay, yeah, we need to go to the hospital. They were asking her for her insurance. Shalin had mistakenly replied no when they asked her if she had it. I'll never forget the tone of her voice when she called me. She's like, mommy, I'm begging them for something for this pain. It hurts so bad. And I'm begging them for some testing to see what's wrong. I asked them for an MRI and they told me, I need to go get insurance and see a specialist because they're not a doctor's office. They failed to notice that there was a blood clot. I think it was a week or two weeks later, she had to fly back to Kansas City. And you know, when you get into a plane, the cabin pressure, causes, you know, it can cause a blood clot to dislodge. And it went into her lungs and caused a massive pulmonary embolism. She had a clot so massive that it was from her ankle up to her groin. <laughs> when the time came, I got up into bed with her. I was there with her when she took her first breath. And I was gonna be with her when she took the, her last. And as she died, I whispered to her, I love you so much. And I promise you, you will not have died in vain. I had made attempts to contact the hospital. No one was really interested in, in speaking. And pretty much it was, we gave the best service for Shalyn. We did everything that we're supposed to do. 
One of the things that really struck out to me as I was searching um, for reasons why Shalynn died, I ran across studies after studies of the discrepancies in outcomes for black and brown women versus white women. As, as a medical community, there needs to be a lot more attention to these discrepancies that she had all of these things that made her higher risk for a blood clot were not taken into an account. She was black, she had sickle cell trait, she had PCOS, she was on birth control, she was overweight, and she had a red swollen leg. She had all these symptoms, she didn't, they didn't check for a blood clot, and instead of them doing the necessary test required, they did what is called a wallet biopsy. And they essentially sent my daughter to her death. How would you feel if it was you? That's the guiding principle you should be thinking about. How do you change going forward? We all know that companies have mitigated risk and risk assessment. We need to stop thinking of it that way. And especially healthcare facilities. These are people's lives. I would say treat your patients like they're your family. Treat it as if you were in that situation to where you would lose your sister, your daughter, or your mother. Don't discriminate towards people. If they're saying they need help, help them like you're supposed to. If you go into the medical field, you should have that passion to help save people. Live up to that passion and save everyone no matter what. And treat them as if they were your family. How would you want your family or your loved one to be treated? So not only is it the, the moral thing to do, but from a business standpoint, I think you're absolutely nuts if you're not reaching out to patients and trying to better what's happening in your facility and stopping the needless deaths. Not stopping it down by a percent, but to none, to none. The sad thing is that when I got Shalyn's phone after she died, I was looking through what she had been doing and because she had been so embarrassed and so demoralized, instead of going to a hospital immediately, as she had been told she needed to get insurance, she was looking up signs of a heart attack hours before she called an ambulance. Hours. As we just saw from Shailene's story, not only did she not receive immediate attention due to the color of her skin, disparity in care happened because the hospital wasn't sure how it would be paid by insurance. Let's talk more about disparities in healthcare. Growing up in rural, uh, segregated uh, Alabama in an area called the Black Belt. So when I, what I saw there and what I still see all these years later is at the time I did not know was disparity. And that disparity uh, I would describe as this indifference. And W.E.B. DeBose described it as a peculiar indifference. And that indifference continues to persist. It is pervasive uh, and it is stubborn. Uh, the result of, of, of this indifference are, are significant uh, less than optimal and poor outcomes for black, indigenous, and other people of color uh, in the United States and, in fact, around the world. And this is uh, quantifiable. Uh, it comes back to us through qualitative measures such as surveys and opinion surveys and the patient experience uh, that we see in healthcare today. So when we think about these disparities then, these differences uh, for specific populations, primarily these marginalized populations. We see this in surgical procedures, surgical outcomes, decisions being made about medical treatment and medical interventions. We see it expressed in the harm that's caused both in outpatient and specifically inpatient setting as it relates to hospital-acquired infections uh, and other hospital-acquired conditions such as falls with injury and pressure ulcer. We also see the same disparities in long-term care facilities. Uh, and there are other marginalized and vulnerable populations where disparities also are present. This is in disabled populations, uh, people who are in the rural areas that are poor, uh, people who have um, some other kind of, of cognitive disability, people who are obese, 
Uh, we see it uh, in the LGBTQ plus population as well. One of the issues that we really need to take on if we're ever going to achieve health equity and uh, eliminate disparities is take a, a honest, courageous look at structural and institutional bias uh, and racism that has been part and parcel of healthcare delivery and clinical decision making far too long. This goes back to the early 1600s when black people first uh, came to the U.S. Uh, as slaves uh, from, from Africa, and it continues to this day. Uh, so then as we begin to uh, have these frank and honest conversations about what are the structures, what are the policies in place that continue to support uh, a system that is currently designed uh, to create disparities and, and create the pain and anguish uh, that many of our patients see, particularly in the black, indigenous, and people of color populations, and again, other marginalized populations. So then as a uh, care provider, what I would say is I have to find ways to be a better service to, to all patients, not just the ones that are insured, not just the ones that are white or high income or, or et cetera. So in order to do that, what I would advocate for uh, is that patients begin to take charge of their health care, that they in fact become part of an abolitionist movement, if I may call it that, so that we begin to address disparities and abolish disparities and abolish inequities, begin to undo uh, deep-seated institutional and structural uh, biases uh, that have existed for far too long. In order to do that, uh, we, we have to engage with the patients uh, and say, you have to be more active in, in your health care uh, and, and enter into those partnerships to co-produce that, if I may call it equity in health care. A big part of this for patients is we, and I'm a patient, learn to communicate, to take charge of our health and our health care. Uh, communicate, ask questions, seek more knowledge about your health care. Uh, uh, begin to break down these paternalistic barriers that have existed for far too long in healthcare settings and, and almost the, the passive acceptance by marginalized communi communities and populations as it relates to their health care. Uh, so in order to do that then, that there, we have to form relationships. Uh, uh, people that we care for uh, need to work on building a trusting relationship with clinical providers, clinical decision makers, uh, and, and truly uh, reach new levels of, of, of activation that we haven't seen to date. Uh, I'm very hopeful that we're having these conversations. I'm very hopeful that we can begin to at least make more progress uh, in issues around health disparity and health care disparity, and, and then start to achieve uh, health equity that we so, so desperately need uh, in health care, not just here in the U.S., but uh, globally. African-American mistrust of healthcare is real. It's a real thing. And what the larger society has to understand is it's well-rooted. There were so many things going on, not just the Tuskegee experiment. There were forced non-consensual sterilizations. My own grandmother, my mom's mother, was an unknowing participant in a radiation experiment that took place at a hospital in Cincinnati from 1960 to 1972. My grandmother died when my mother was 15. It was devastating to their family. And these kinds of stories are pervasive across the country with black people. And so there is a history there, not just the Tuskegee experiment, but other things that took place in healthcare that make African-Americans not trust the system. And then when you go into a hospital today and have some of the experiences that I had, nurses asking, how can your parents afford to be here? Or people bringing garbage to my dad. And then when we talk to the nurse manager, they say, well, we don't get many blacks here. When you have that kind of flippant behavior, when you have that kind of um, offensiveness, it's easy to understand why blacks don't trust health care. So we've got to repair that trust. We've got to build a bridge and be better. We've got to start looking at health care and the way we treat patients of color. 
In a pandemic, unfortunately, minorities suffer disproportionately. Recent statistics show that Blacks had 2.6 more times the risk of dying after contracted COVID-19. In New York City as well, Black people make up 22% of the population, but accounted for 28% of COVID-19 deaths. And similar trends can be seen among Hispanic and Latino populations at national and state levels. A pandemic unveils our different realities. Everybody should take COVID-19 seriously. And by this, I do not mean living in fear, but we should be properly informed about common symptoms and recognize that some people have a high risk of progressing to a condition where hospitalization might be needed, especially people above the age of 60 and those who suffer diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Unfortunately, again, these chronic conditions are far more common in certain minorities. It is a responsibility to help spread the message of prevention in all our communities. As physicians, we strive to save and improve lives, but we can also do so by avoiding errors, by creating a safe and transparent environment in the hospital. This is a big change of paradigm. I believe that preventing errors is a condition that can cause more than 250,000 deaths per year in the United States. And this condition should be studied rigorously. And above all, we should act together with full transparency. I am proud to represent this movement that has the potential to improve our lives immensely. Unite for Safe Care represents to me hope, health, and happiness. If you're a person of color and you're a patient in the hospital, there are a couple of things I feel like you should really hold as central. You need to hold with both generosity and clarity that racial bias in the healthcare system is a thing. And so that mean, when I say generosity and clarity, what I mean by that is generosity toward the human beings behind the system that are struggling. And when I say clarity, I mean, even though you hold the humanity of the people and you treat them like human beings first, I'm talking about doctors, nurses, etc. just be clear that racial bias is a thing and you're gonna need to advocate for yourself. So advocate for yourself, do it early and do it often and don't make any assumptions. When it comes to disparities, in the healthcare system right now, especially due to COVID. I have a personal stake in this because I'm pregnant right now, but black maternal health is really on my mind. I've just read so many stories about black mamas who are not getting access to the kind of testing that they need because there's so many barriers that so many people have anyway about going to the doctor. But in the era of a pandemic, when you're getting constant messages from the hospital to do as many appointments via video as you can, you don't have someone touching your belly to figure out how big your uterus is. Maybe you're not going in for frequent blood tests. Maybe doctors are missing things. And many of the women, the black women who have died in childbirth in this era of COVID was because they missed these vital tests. So one recommendation that I would have around this is I would love to see hospitals doing more outdoor care, especially in this era of COVID. If we know that being indoors, I didn't go to the hospital as much as I needed to this pregnancy because I didn't want to be inside. I didn't want to be stuck inside of a hospital room with an N95 mask, just shaking and praying that I didn't get infected. But there are certain tests that can be done outside. What would it look like for a phlebotomist station to be set up outdoors? That is something that feels very important to me. Patients of color, I would say, need to make sure that they're going to credible sources to be informed in regards to COVID-19. And with that, I would also ask people to be responsible in using social media. Social media is a great platform, but you have to know when to use it. And social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter should not be your end all and be all for your source of information, especially as it pertains to the medical points of this pandemic. I think if you're trying to find credible information, you want to rely on credible sources and that are based in the science and medical facts. And you can find good resources from the CDC website. You can find good information 
at chicago.gov. There's a subsection on that website uh, that specifically talks about COVID-19, as well as the Illinois Department of Health website. So those are good sources that you can rely on for credible information. Also, this is a, a small, more medically related fact. Um, people of color tend to be more vitamin D deficient. So we all think about vitamin D as it relates to our bones, but vitamin D also has a, an immune protective effect. And a lot of people of color, uh, particularly African Americans, tend to be vitamin D deficient. So because we've seen that in treating patients with coronavirus that vitamin D has a positive effect, I would urge people to be more knowledgeable about their own vitamin D status and if you're deficient or low that you want to make sure that you're keeping up your vitamin D through your diet and possibly with supplementation. As a Native American woman, I have a very special message. Um, health issues in our reservations, in our communities, are, are we don't have much due to poverty, due to lack of facilities uh, on the reservations. It's very sad with what's going on with the COVID. Per capita, the rates of death and infection are higher than the population in general in the United States. And I have special words that you please understand what is going on. We're talking about people who do not have running water, gas, or electricity. 40% of the reservations lack those basic rights. Uh, we are trying to fight for those things, but people do not pay attention to us very often. So again, this is very important for Native people. I'm addressing you personally. Please learn. You have rights. And please use those rights and speak up. Hello, everyone. My name is Styx, rapper slash activist, and I'm coming to you live from Think Watts headquarters right here in Watts, California. When it comes to bringing new messages to the world, I'm all about it. And today, I want to talk about the patient safety movement and the Unite for Safe Care campaign. It's all about bringing awareness for medical errors. And did you know that medical errors are the third leading cause of death today in America? And did you also know that the black and brown community have rates of infection and medical errors higher than any other background and culture? The disparity between the two cultures is insurmountable. Creator, grandfather, grandmother, I offer this prayer, a very short prayer, for the world to hear. I'm asking for blessings for all people who are ill at this time, who are suffering in some way, Creator. I ask this in a good way. I ask for our spirits and our ancestors to surround us and give us good energy and to be healthy and to have good food, clean water, and all the things that we need for life that are simple, nothing more food, and good health, Creator. I ask for all caretakers that they realize these are human beings to always treat them with kindness, especially during this pandemic. Uh, I see many frontline workers, they put in hours and hours of work, and they're the last person to hold that person who is passing their hand. Their family is not allowed to be with them, and it's such a hard time. So Creator, these are my special prayers and I ask it this for in a good way. Aho, Neshu Nachama. We have a special treat uh, for you all today. Uh, Dariush, one of the most incredible voices of our time uh, with 75 million followers around the world. Uh, someone who I grew up listening to his music probably gave me my social consciousness as he sang about the big problems facing the people of Iran when I was just a kid in, I guess, 1972. <laughs> His music is incredible. His um, courage to speak the truth is even more incredible. And I have had the great honor of meeting him and befriending him. And as he began facing and heeding to the call for opioid addiction, he even took on 
our challenge of patient safety. And from the day he met me, he did everything he could to educate his viewers, listeners on the patient safety problem and what can be done to improve it. I'm delighted that he's here to share some of his beautiful music with us. And I'm grateful for his friendship and his uh, dedication to the people everywhere. Yoyush. اشتباهات پزشکی و کادر درمانی سالیانه جان بیش از دو میلیون نفر رو میگیره. سازمان جنبش ایمنی بیماران به مردم اینو یادآوری میکنه که برای جان خودشون، عزیزانشون و جامعه ای که در اون زندگی میکنن میتونن در کنار این سازمان آمار رو بیارم به صفر برسونن چرا که این سازمان اهمیتش در اینه که به جان انسان ارج میذاره improving patient safety and achieving zero harm is a responsibility and a human right we have to know our rights and support the patient safety movement foundation united we can save lives یکی از دوستان نازنینم و بسیاری از دوستان دیگه که امشب تشریف بردن ازشون سپاسگزارم دوست عزیز من آقای جو کیانی که امشب اینجا هستن یکی از تحسین برانگیزترین شرکت های فناوری پزشکی رو در جهان تأسیس کردن که باعث این شد که بسیاری از بیماران میلیون ها بیمار نجات پیدا کنن دستگاه های مختلفی که شرکت ایشون درست کرد ولی به نظر من زنده باشیم بله مهمترین من همیشه معتقدم مفید و مهم چقدر با همدیگه رابطه دارن و کار مفیدی که مفیدتر به نظر من انجام دادن جنبشی است که از هشت سال پیش به راه افتاده و جنبش ایمنی بیماران پیشنت 
سیفتی موبمند این حرکت دعوت میکنه از تمام پزشکان تمام بیماران تمام کسانی که هممون به یک نوعی نیاز داریم به خاطر اینه میگم همه باید در یک زنجیره باشیم و حضور ما مخصوصا پزشکان خیلی مهمه که به این حرکت بپیوندن در امریکا سالانه دویست هزار نفر به خاطر اشتباهات پیشگیرانه البته میشه پیشگیری کرد اشتباهاتی که اتفاق افتاده دویست هزار نفر از بین رفتن در دنیا دو میلیون بیشتر از دو میلیون حرکتی که آیه کیانی کردن جهانیست نتیجتا حمایت مردم کنار همدیگه بودن به این حرکت کمک میکنه و همایش بزرگی است در واشنگتن دی سی که من هم افتخار حضور خواهم داشت و مهمتر از همه این که سازمان بهداشت جهانی روز 17 سپتامبر رو روز پیشند سیفتی نام نهاده و باعث افتخار ما ایرانیا باید باشه که آیه کیانی این حرکت رو انجام داده ما ازشون سپاس کنیم My daughter Leah was incredible. She was the life of our family. As I look back, when you see pictures of her and video of her, her spirit just comes through. She was alive. We never knew why she carried a purse. We used to tease her about it because she was so little to carry a purse. And then we found out it was because she had snacks for her little sister in the purse. And in the mornings when I'd get the girls up for school, and she, I'd always say, Leah, Leah, come on. No, Mom, I'm so tired. And I'd go in her room and I'd pull off the cover. She'd be all dressed. Her hair would be in braids. You know, she'd just be messing with me. <laughs> but that's who Leah was. She just, um, she was remarkable. She had a pectus carinatum, which is where it's, the people call it pigeon chest. Your, your chest comes out. And so every morning she'd get up and put on a T-shirt and, you know, be uncomfortable. I took her to a doctor and they said, well, you can do something about it, but they didn't tell me like there was no need to and that it was really a major surgery. So um, we did that and, and, he, and a lot of things went wrong that day. So we went to the room and she was on an epidural for pain. So they kept increasing her fentanyl and whatever to the highest amount and she was in pain so she wasn't getting pain relief if she was just getting her 80 pound body saturated with narcotics my husband had to leave to go home to our other children and he said to the nurse I really don't want to get in anybody's business but my child is way over medicated and I don't want anyone to give her more medicine and the in Resident said, um, if you're not gonna allow me to increase her narcotics, I'll give her something for anxiety because she has to take deeper breaths. Maybe she's just scared of the pain. So it turned out that the resident had written an order for two milligrams of Ativan every two hours. Now, if you're familiar with Ativan, two milligrams of Ativan would put a grown man to sleep. She never spoke again after that first injection of Ativan. She was not on any monitors. The law is every two to four hours, you take somebody's vitals and monitor them. I had been awake for 30 hours, and I remember sitting in the chair. It was midnight, I was watching Saturday Night Live, and I always remember Al Gore was the guest host, and I dozed off, and I woke up some time around two, and she was dead. I screamed 
and they came and for 40 minutes they're pounding on her chest to resuscitate her and I'm sitting in the hall crying because I know she's dead I've seen her and I called my husband to come back and I have a memory of my husband walking down the hall of the hospital and I was sitting on the floor and I looked up and I said Leah died he fell to the ground and took a couple of people to pick him up and put him on a bed. And when I went home that day and told my other daughters, basically that was the end of our perfect family as we had known it. This was so avoidable. Had she been on a monitor, um, they would have detected that her breathing was deteriorating and the dose of narcotic was way too high and something would have triggered an alert before she died while I was sleeping. And monitoring is, is so easy nowadays. I mean, the, the new technology is so simple, you know, and inexpensive and not invasive and to find somebody dead in bed is inexcusable. I knew I couldn't live my life and not do something. So I focused on what I want to be Leah's law, which I think is so simple, continuous post-op monitoring for patients on opioids. 800 children will die this year because they're not on a monitor after surgery. That's so easy. You're not supposed to bury your children, and especially not healthy children. So. I can't not do this for her. Even if Leah's law never becomes a law, just to inform people, if you're in a hospital, demand a monitor. Leah's video it's really hard for me to watch. It really hits home. It hits home because of many reasons. One, the day, unfortunately, Leah was being buried, my daughter had a surgery at the same institution with the same surgeon. And while the surgeon was brilliant, as he was for my daughter, as I'm sure he was for Leah, a simple lack of monitoring took her away from us. And it hits home because I invented, I'm a co-inventor of measure through motion and low perfusion pulse oximetry. And by revolutionizing pulse oximetry to make it work even when patients move, we know this technology can be used to help monitor patients on opioids. So to not care enough to make monitoring a requirement for every patient that's been given opioid, I think is wrong. And I think it's inhumane, especially since we know every institution who implements continuous monitoring of patients on opioids saves money too. In fact, the Dartmouth-Hitchcock study showed $7 million a year savings because they reduced rapid response team activation by over 50%, and they reduced ICU transfers by over 50%. So we can do this, we need to do this. We've been working with legislators around the party lines, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, to align the incentives and increase transparency so that things like continuous monitoring for people getting opioids in hospital and even at home will become a standard. And while we're still not there, there's been a lot of incredible effort done by many senators, by many members of Congress, including Senator Whitehouse and someone that uh, I consider a f great friend here in California, Senator Barbara Boxer. When she was in the Senate and she heard Leah's story, she decided to write a letter to every hospital in California asking them what are they doing about medication errors and patient safety. And she went to the hospitals that had done a lot of good work, 
like UCSF, to congratulate them and publicly acknowledge the efforts that they had put in place to combat medical errors that were killing so many people. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce you our <laughs> favorite senator, Barbara Boxbrook in California, and a great friend of mine, and someone who's a fighter for all the people who don't have a voice. So without further ado, here's a message from Senator Barbara Boxer. Thank you. When I heard from the patient safety movement that medical errors were the third leading cause of death, I was stunned. I was shocked. I didn't even believe it. I said, prove it to me. And they did. More than 200,000 people a year die of medical errors. So behind the numbers killed by heart disease, cancer, uh, then comes medical errors. So I said, what can I do? I was a senator then, it was a long time ago. And they said, well, you need to support legislation to make sure that we don't reward hospitals that have these very bad outcomes. So I did that and did it and did it. We did get something into Obamacare, not enough, and more needs to be done. I met with so many families who had lost loved ones because of medical errors. And when you stop to look at what these errors are, it's stunning. Wash, a lot of things we're learning, uh, by the way, from COVID, which is simply washing your hands. We had situations in hospitals where hands weren't being washed. That's a leading cause of problems. And it would go on from there. Mistaken medicine, giving the wrong medicine to the wrong patient. These are simple things, but we have to crack down uh, where there are problems. And we can get this down to zero. We've been making progress with the leadership of the patient safety leaders. Um, I've been so proud uh, to be a small part of this. I lost my own dad so many years ago at a, at a younger age than he would have lived to. I know that because his brothers and sisters all lived to ripe old ages. He died at 69 because somebody gave him kind of a, a medical regime that was not, uh, had not been tested. So I carry this issue in my heart. Um, what would it be if we finally said, if you don't have good sanitation, you're gonna lose funding. What, how bad can it be if we say, if you don't make sure patients that are lying in beds get turned over so they don't get bed sores, what could it be? What could it be? What's wrong with it? If we finally had a situation where rooms were sanitized and disinfected as patients moved out. So it's, it's some of these things are so simple making sure that you give the right medicine to the right patient. So I hope and pray that this year, um, as we deal with COVID, which is so difficult, that we can make a real change here and make sure that we get these unnecessary deaths down to zero. I hope you'll be with me in this and thank you for all you do. I'm delighted to introduce two great senators of our United States of America to our program today. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and Senator Todd Young. Senator Young, who will be speaking next, has uh, worked with us for many years and has worked with uh, Senator Whitehouse to understand the problems we face in our hospitals when it comes to patient safety and help craft legislation to hopefully uh, fix the problems in a big way, from improving the transparency to aligning the incentives. I'm grateful for uh, both of these senators, both Republican and Democrat, to be working together so closely to help the patients of our country. Senator Young. Thank you so much, Joe. I, I want to thank you for your leadership and uh, thank the entire foundation uh, for uh, 
your leadership with respect to the patient safety movement and, and uh, making sure that uh, we continue to make a difference, uh, not just uh, in policy circles and on Capitol Hill, but really uh, you should all understand that I know the real work has, has been done in the trenches and on the front lines uh, by individuals like you who've been advocates for patient safety, some of you for a number of years. And uh, to the extent we can be force multipliers up here on Capitol Hill working with all of you to develop legislation that uh, aligns incentives between our healthcare providers on one hand and the patients on the other, uh, we want to continue to do that. So um, I've been briefed that we have over 200,000 of our family members, our neighbors, um, you know, our parents, our, our mothers, our fathers, uh, our siblings, who walk into a hospital on an annual basis and they never walk out again. That's why all of you are involved in uh, this cause. That's why I certainly am involved in, in it. And we want to prevent these preventable errors, uh, whether they're hospital-acquired infections or so-called never events, from never happening again. I share your goal, which is making sure uh, we reach uh, zero, that is zero preventable errors by 2020. It's gonna take, of course, a lot of work to get there, but I think that uh, we have an incredibly powerful lever at the federal level with respect to how we compensate medical providers. And this obviously was brought to my attention by Joe and others uh, at the foundation. And we've been working towards that end, changing uh, the compensation system uh, ever since really that, that first meeting. It's unacceptable to me that it takes, estimates vary somewhat, but it takes roughly 15 years for best practices of clinical research to find their way into actual clinical practice. And we can compress that timeline significantly uh, here again if we align incentives uh, appropriately. So. I do believe that our legislation will not only help prevent errors, but also lead to this incentive where we, we shorten the time frame that best practices make their way into clinical practice and uh, thus prevent complications and, and uh, even deaths. So um, I will continue to, to work with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. We've been working on legislation for some period of time now. Joe, I have to say, and I say this uh, commendably, Joe, Joe has been uh, persistent, vigilant, <laughs> even at times impatient, and I share your impatience uh, with the bureaucracy here, and, and we've been uh, fighting through uh, some of that, and, and uh, I think we're very, very close uh, to arriving where we need to be to uh, end up seeing this legislation signed into law. Uh, we will also, I should add, uh, I know some of you have an interest in, in whether we've been working with other agencies of government, but it's our office's intention working with other offices and, and my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to reach out to Department of Defense, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, and other agencies that have a very strong uh, role in the healthcare space and, and to make sure that they too are, are part of this movement and properly incented uh, to uh, adopt appropriate uh, clinical protocols that will prevent errors and, uh, and uh, uh, suboptimal treatment. Hi, this is Senator Sheldon Whitehouse on World Patient Safety Day. Uh, I am here to stand with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and healthcare groups around the country who are fighting to make sure that we reduce Americans' exposure to hospital-acquired infections and other such hospital-acquired injuries. Uh, if this were a disease, it would be one of the leading dangers uh, in America. And to address it is going to require all of us to work together. So please join me in supporting of the patient safety movement and protecting our loved ones. Thank you so much. We need our elected officials to work with us to address this terrible problem of safety in hospitals and health centers. We've seen with the pandemic just how dangerous it can be when a health center has trouble controlling an infectious disease. 
Well, there are many other things that can go wrong in a healthcare system, and we need support, and we need help, and we need legislation to make sure that we can protect future generations of Americans from the kinds of problems that are such a, a terrible, debilitating stress right now on our healthcare system. So, for example, we need to have public reporting of infection rates by facility for every nursing home, every hospital, every ambulatory surgery center, dialysis center, hospice. We need all of that information. All of us deserve that information as Americans, and it will be very useful to all of the facilities so they can track their own infections. And public health officials, such as the CDC, can find those hotspots and send support in to the facilities where, that are having problems. We need to get that together as a country. We should, we should be the, the greatest place on earth to prevent an infection. That should be the United States. And that's going to start by knowing where the infections are happening now. So we are all, uh, we are all in with Unite for Safe Care to do everything we can on the public sector, among lawmakers, as well as uh, among the business community, employers, and all of us who work in and with the healthcare system side by side to improve the care of all Americans. The biggest single change we could do is to adjust our laws so that there is absolute clarity for doctors, nurses, and other health professionals between the ordinary human errors that all of us make in our working lives and gross negligence, which should never be acceptable. And at the moment, because that line is blurred in medicine, too many medical professionals are fearful that if they're open about a mistake, that could end up costing them their career. We can change that with some simple adjustments to the law as have worked extremely effectively in other industries, the airline industry, the nuclear industry, the oil industry, where they've learnt that actually being forgiving for the ordinary human error that we're all prone to is the way you make it possible to be open about mistakes, to learn from them and make sure they're never repeated. Unite for safe care. What does this mean? Okay, I'm a hospital doctor by training, and I can tell you, we gave lip service to safety for 20 years since this became you know, into the public consciousness. It's still not in our consciousness enough. We talk about it, improving outcomes, patient safety, all of that, and, it's st and it, hospitals are still the most dangerous places on earth. And you look at during the pandemic, they're dangerous not just for patients, they're dangerous for staff. They've been dangerous for staff and patients for a long time. There's violence against healthcare professionals and there's violence against patients in the form of medical errors that are preventable. And why after all these years have we not been able to make it better? The main reason is we don't get paid for quality. You can invent technology that improves safety. You can, and I've talked to these entrepreneurs on my show and they to a one say, but nobody gets paid for patient safety. Nobody gets paid for quality. You're incentivized to do procedures to patients, not to keep them safe. You're paid to do things to people, not for people. And that fundamental misaligned incentive means that we now have a system that has emerged that is chaotic, unsafe, has a culture of retribution against healthcare professionals that make mistakes instead of a culture of a just culture where we actually support each other. We go through a process and go, if this wasn't a malicious mistake, you should be educated. You should be given a chance that we should be able to apologize to our patients without being afraid of being sued. These are such fundamental human values for our patients and ourselves as caregivers. And yet, we haven't gotten there. That's why I think the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is so important because as we educate the public, we also educate healthcare providers and we change our fundamental conception of what it means to take care of patients safely. Safety should be the absolute 
highest priority, like it is in the airline industry. But in the process of that, we should be supporting each other as caregivers instead of adding yet another click box or another piece of work that we have to do and we're already overwhelmed burning out, suffering moral injury from having to serve the, the employer master, the patient, our own conscience, and that's tearing us apart. That's not good for patients. So I think that with Patient Safety Movement Foundation, with the Unite for Safe Care campaign, World Patient Safety Day, all of this together, it's now our time during this pandemic, never let a crisis go to waste. During this pandemic is our time to step up and say, we're going to do better for our patients and for each other starting today. And that means lobbying our politicians for different payment models that pay us to keep patients well and keep them safe. And if we start with that and are given the tools, resources, and autonomy to accomplish it, we'll do it. But we need that guidance. All right, guys, thank you so much for letting me speak here and we out. Thanks so much for inviting me to participate in the World Patient Safety Day. You know, mistakes happen in every field of work, but when they happen in healthcare, they often lead to suffering and even death. That's what happened to five-year-old Gabby Galbo of Monticello, Illinois. Gabby died on May 11, 2012, from septic shock after an infection caused by a tick. It went untreated by multiple doctors during many, many hospital visits. Had multiple medical errors not been made in Gabby's care, she would have celebrated her 14th birthday on July 28th of this year. Tragically, this is not an isolated story. Every year, 200,000, up to 400,000 Americans die as a result of medical errors. Today, I'm proud to join with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation to raise public awareness about the need to improve our healthcare system for both patients and healthcare workers. Sadly, the coronavirus pandemic is shining a spotlight on this issue. We've seen how shortages of personal protective equipment and testing kits have literally threatened the lives of healthcare workers and patients across the country. To date, more than 900 healthcare workers have died from COVID-19 in the United States. The majority of them were people of color. More must be done to both protect our frontline workers and the patients they treat. As we look for ways to improve our nation's healthcare system, we must figure out better, more effective ways to protect healthcare workers and minimize medical errors. Thanks for all you're doing to save lives today and every day. So the question is, is it time for a National Patient Safety Authority? I say it's time to try something new. It's clear we've failed in changing people and their behavior at the front line, in imparting true quality safety engineering principles every day in the way we do work. So let's think about changing systems. What if we made our systems safer? That's what we do in nuclear energy, in cybersecurity, in bioterrorism, and air traffic control. We change the environment. We change policies we make our systems fail safe. We have a model at the federal level, an agency called the National Transportation Safety Board that has made transportation more reliable, more predictable, and self-correcting. We can use this model. Think of their solutions, airbags, anti-collision technology, fail-safe self-regulating valves, smoke detectors, Think policies as well. They helped us raise the drinking age to 21. They set standards for school bus construction. They introduced alcohol and drug testing. Let's think about this. Astronauts don't get themselves to the moon and back safely. Their equipment does. The potential for harm is predicted and solutions applied. The equipment corrects itself. It's autonomous. Of course, humans will always have a role, but we can relieve humans of much of their workarounds that are tiresome, their unreliable equipment, their critical information gaps. It's 2020. We have technology that could help us and we need to apply it. We have predictive analytics, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence. We can make safety autonomous. 
over 15 federal agencies and numerous independent organizations now collect information on safety. Some of it is more reliable than others, but even the best data aren't aligned. It's time for a centralized approach to using the reliable data that we collect and applying it to solutions. That's what the National Transportation Safety Board does. So if we added in the functions of the Transportation Board, research, investigation, education, and we put them together, we'd have a powerful National Patient Safety Authority. It's not punitive, doesn't issue regulations, sanctions, and penalties. It just comes up with good solutions. And then it's up to our Health and Human Services Department, our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the CDC, OSHA, the FDA, to apply them and to apply them universally. That's how we fix our systems. That's how we get safe. I'm all in favor of a National Patient Safety Authority. Thank you. Your one job as a parent is to protect your children. And so, um, Alyssa was diagnosed with leukemia on a Monday afternoon. And she died 10 days later. You do not die of leukemia in 10 days. She died of medical errors. She got a hospital-acquired infection with a C. diff. Um, there was a boy in the room next door to her in this hospital, they shared bathrooms, and he got C. diff and died. But I didn't find that out until months later. She became septic, but they had ordered lab tests to look at this, and when the lab tests came back, they showed there were critical values, and no one acted on them. They did last rites before she went into surgery. And to sit there and think, you might not get your child back again. But she came out of the surgery, and it was then that they told us there's nothing they could do. She died a painful, a horrific death. One of the hardest things, it's um, 
It's the loss of hopes and dreams. What would her future have looked like? What was her career? For so long, I couldn't take a family picture because I couldn't have that missing piece. I fought for years to try to get answers. And that is inhumane to treat someone that way after you've had a loss. And it took the organization three years, seven months, and 28 days to meet with me and have the first real honest conversation. And one of the biggest gifts anyone can give us after a loved one's been harmed is transparency. The first thing is tell us what happened. The second thing is take accountability. The third is I'm sorry. Those words are so powerful and if they're genuine, I mean, I don't know anyone that when they've heard them just doesn't break down and cry. The fourth is tell us how you're gonna fix the problem. One of the things we need to know is if we've lost a child or a loved one and we know it's happened again, then it's like their loss was in vain. But the fifth one that I think is becoming more and more important is let us be part of the solution if we want to be part of the solution. And for a couple reasons, for some people, it's the way to know the problem was fixed. For others, it's a healing factor. And for some, it's a way to honor their loved ones. Three years, seven months, and 28 days. That's how long it took for this family to get answers. As a mother, I cannot imagine the pain and anguish this must have caused. And as a healthcare professional, I know that hospital-acquired infections are preventable. Errors such as this don't happen because of individual mistakes, but rather because of deeply rooted system and process problems that must be addressed if we're gonna prevent other families from experiencing this same pain. Now it is my privilege to introduce our next segment, where we asked hospital executives to share what they've been doing to address these issues in their organizations, both here in the U.S. and internationally. My first question is to Chuck Holland, a hospital CEO from Chicago, Illinois. Chuck, what have you done in your system to bring person-centered care to your patients and families? And how have you prepared your staff for the shift from clinician-centered care? I think importantly, we've built a patient family advisory council that challenges the hospital on what we can do better. We've also opened an ambulatory care center that's focused on a one-stop, customer-friendly um, approach to our outpatient services that was a much-needed service to the community, focused on prevention and wellness. We've also established employee service excellence teams that focus on setting standards for patient care and recognizing employees for attention to patient needs. To bring patient-centered care to our staff, we train our staff using peers as trainers on the importance of service and quality care to patients, their families, and the community. Thanks, Chuck. Wow, what great work you're doing in your community. It's critical that social disparities are addressed in order for hospitals to truly provide person-centered care. Now let's hear from Dr. Wayne Shu, a hospital superintendent from Taichung, Taiwan. Dr. Shu, what has your organization done to shift from a clinician-centered culture to a patient-centered one? We have promoted patient-centered or called holistic care as one of our core values in the hospital for decades. In reaching these goals, we had constantly over training and sharing education, promoting quality improvement circles with annual competitions and learning, engage in smart and convenient services process by applying new IT technology. We also encourage behavior changes to practice, for example, using one of the mutual communication ways called shared decision-making, and most importantly, to cultivate the patient-centered concepts embedded in daily work in the hospitals. 
Thank you, Dr. Shu. Shared decision-making is definitely necessary to shift to a more patient-centered practice. And finally, let's hear from Dr. Anthony Staines from Perley, Switzerland. Dr. Staines, you're a former hospital CEO who now leads a regional patient safety improvement program. What do you think that organizations need to do to improve patient-centered care? In my experience, it makes a tremendous difference in terms of safety if the patient is involved and engaged in his or her care. But to be involved and engaged in his or her care, the patient must get the right information, must have opportunities to discuss that information, to discuss alternatives, and also it's important that the patient adheres, is in agreement with the care that he or she receives. I believe it can be very dangerous if the patient doesn't understand the care that he's getting or she's getting, um, or if the provider believes that the patient is in agreement when in fact he or she is not. Another thing that is important is understanding what matters to the patient, because that's the way to provide the right information, the information and the solutions that are customized and compatible with the person's situation, preferences and values. Thank you, Dr. Staines, that's excellent. What matters to the patient should absolutely be our guiding principle in providing safer care. My next question is about continuous improvement in healthcare. One of the reasons that so many hospitals struggle to eliminate errors is because we've historically worked in department silos rather than viewing improvement from a system level. So Chuck, what has your organization done to eliminate such silos? I think during this period of the pandemic and the uh, unrest throughout the country in addressing institutional racism and the systemic racism that's throughout our society, um, our hospital has done some soul searching as well around the whole issue of racism and we've done education with our staff and um, reinforcing how the systemic and institutional racism has an impact on health disparities which is a huge issue on our community and on the south side of chicago tangential to that we also emphasize reaching outside the walls of the hospital to address social determinants of health so food as an issue housing as an issue violence and disinvestment in our communities uh, we've partnered with the Chicago um, food banks to provide food for the community. We have been um, the sponsor of an affordable housing project in the community to provide affordable housing opportunities for um, the community. We're totally invested in community development as the community's single largest employer. And we're also involved in the city, on the, in particular on the city's racial equity rapid response team that's partnered with other providers in the area to really address the whole issue of racial equality and, its, um, and the disparities issue that we all face in order to address healthcare in a more comprehensive way. That's great, Chuck. I love how much of a focus you have on involving your frontline staff. That's definitely key to eliminating silos. Dr. Shu, how about you? What has your organization done to improve collaboration across disciplines? We have implemented reorganization, education training to eliminate the silo effects. For example, not only executive levels have regular terms, but also administrative employees regularly rotated to work at different departments. We regularly invited outstanding outside speakers to share their experience with us. We believe that having physicians engage in quality improvement are critical. We particularly welcome those activities in the areas of cross-discipline, collaboration, and communications. Thank you, Dr. Shu. You're so right. Involving physicians in improvement work is absolutely critical. Dr. Staines, what thoughts do you have for us on this? Well, care is a word that, that we use in the singular form, but in fact, there are many plural aspects 
in care. Care comes from different sources, from many carers and many providers, and from the patient himself. And to work safely, all of this has to be coordinated and work as one system. That's what we call care integration. And when care is not integrated, well, there are duplicates, omissions, delays, inconsistencies, and that can be very disruptive for the patient, frustrating, uh, sometimes depressing, but often harmful. So what can be done? Well, teamwork can be used, structured communication, information systems, Team medicine is so important to produce care integration. And if the patient can get involved in his or her care, he or she can contribute to integration through his or her questions uh, and help coordinate and integrate care. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Staines. I love how you reinforce the importance of structured communication and the use of information systems in breaking down those silos. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing your insights with us as we all continue to work on continuous process improvements within our healthcare systems. I hope you stay safe and stay well.
check out the polo I'm wearing. This is a great conversation starter and a way to raise awareness while supporting the movement. Click the link in the description below to order one now. All proceeds go directly to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. This is the call that started it all. Small cell and I think she broke her hip. The ambulance is on the way. When my mom went into the hospital for a routine partial hip replacement. He knew something was wrong. The neurologist told us, your mom is in a coma. And now it's brutally clear. I need a lawyer. We have not even begun to recognize the country's third leading cause of death, medical care gone wrong. The medical profession needs to be accountable for the errors. These are our costs, $421,000. Meds, health insurance, taxes, all roads lead to the insurance company. Their whole plan is to drag this out as long as they can. You're a lawyer, am I correct? No, I'm a comedy director. This is taking over our lives. Problems in healthcare continue to be endemic. We're not learning from our mistakes. Something has to change so this doesn't keep happening to people. Shortly after being released, I watched the HBO award-winning documentary film Bleed Out. By the end of the film, I was so angry. The devastating, life-changing, permanent, but very preventable harm inflicted on Judy Burroughs followed by the lying, deceit, and cover-up after the event made me embarrassed to be in healthcare. Lead Out is a must-see movie that shares the many things that are wrong in healthcare today. I reached out to Steve and Margot Burroughs shortly after watching the movie and apologized for the toxic deny and defend culture inherent in many health systems, as well as medical malpractice today. The Burroughs family knows all too well how badly the system is broken and now are working with us to make care safer and more transparent for all. Here to share his story is my very good friend, Steve Burroughs. I'm Steve Burroughs, writer director of the HBO documentary film Bleed Out. Bleed Out is about my mom, Judy Burroughs, a vivacious world traveling, retired school teacher who 11 years ago went in for a routine partial hip replacement and came out in a coma with permanent brain damage. That horrific event began a decades long battle of my mom fighting for her life and our family fighting for accountability, transparency, and justice in what happened to her. The preventable medical errors in my mom's case were not only individual but systemic and pervasive. The pain and suffering my mom endured was devastating. The collateral damage to our family, incalculable. I became obsessed with getting my mother the best medical care possible, as well as trying to find out what happened to her so that it would never happen to anyone else on earth again. I became obsessed with accountability. Now I can tell you that for almost 10 years, my family and I felt we were all alone. We thought this was just one long nightmare of a horrible cascade of medical mistakes that unfortunately happened to just my mom. But then I found out, almost by accident, that medical error is the third leading cause of death in America. I was floored. You mean we're not alone? That there are other patients and families out there just like us? Now this was a profoundly humbling discovery for me. Bittersweet in the extreme is I was terrified to learn that this happens a thousand times a day in America, while simultaneously comforted by the fact that our family was indeed not alone, now part of this huge club that none of us wanted to belong to. Now once I found out that our story, our personal story, was a universal story. I knew that I had to tell that story. Medical harm does not discriminate. It can happen to anyone, at any time, all over the world, and it does. Complicating matters even more, these aren't criminals or Wall Street robber baron types or any of the usual suspect bad guys. These were the good guys, doctors and hospitals and nurses, heroes, the folks we blindly trust with our lives. How could this possibly be? Now, like so many others before me, Advocating for patient safety became not a job or a career, but now a calling. I didn't want to just tell my mom's story. I needed to tell my mom's story. And now through our film, I've had the very fortuitous gift of meeting thousands of other patients and their families who have either been injured or have lost loved ones due to preventable medical errors. Because of these beautiful human beings, each in their own way giving voice to the voiceless, the helplessness that I carried for years was replaced by hope. Not fake hope or movie hope or I'm just saying it because I have to hope, 
but real, deep down in your blood, bone, and guts hope. And for that, I thank those folks sincerely. After a ferocious battle for the life she once had, my mom passed away earlier this year, finally succumbing to the injuries inflicted upon her all those years before. Even through all our family's troubles, I could never fully understand what it was like to lose a loved one this way. Now I know. It is my absolute honor and privilege to introduce this memorial and tribute section of our program to these victims of medical error. I am in awe of them and what they stand for. Here's a photo gallery now to remind us of those who we lost, accompanied by the poignant music and lyrics of Michael Stillwater's Healing Light. God bless these souls and their families. Not only will you never be forgotten, but your stories, the legacy of your lives, are saving lives. Give wings to my heart And roll away the storm Let me breathe in The beauty of The mystery that lives within Let my heart fly on wings Fly on wings into the sky And roll away the storm I don't wonder why I'm trusting life knows the way for me to go And it lives inside my heart My wings are flying me out from the dark to the morning the light in my heart the light in my heart is always shining the light in my heart is ever new the light in my heart is always shining I know this much is true Light in my heart is always shining Light in my heart is ever new The light in my heart is always shining And I know this much is true Let healing light surround me Let healing light be here Let healing light find a way into every crack and every tear let the healing light open me up right now. Let the healing light bring me back home, bring me back home, bring me back. Thank you, Michael Stillwater, for sharing your wonderful talents with that beautiful tribute to those we've lost. 
My name is Monica McDade, and I'm the campaign director for Unite for Safe Care. Coming up, we want to share the stories of patients that have survived. Surviving medical errors should be joyful. However, sometimes it is a cautionary tale of what you never want to have happen to anyone else. In this space, let us celebrate those who have survived medical harm and see what these inspiring people have gone on to do. Let's watch Alicia Cole's story. Just as the nurse was about to put down the white padding that was over my incision, my mother said, wait a minute, there's something on her stomach. It looked like a mole. And my mother asked the nurse to call the doctor to come back, and uh, she didn't want to. She said, I am not going to call the doctor for what's going to turn out to be nothing. My mother said, I'll call the doctor. I'll never forget, I was looking at my doctor, and I raised the gauze, and I just saw his face completely change. And when I looked down at my abdomen, the black dot was gone, and there was a quarter-sized pustule. The infection kept spreading, and it was starting to go down my leg. Over two million patients a year get hospital-acquired infections. I ended up having six more surgeries, nine blood transfusions. I left the hospital with an open abdomen that took three years to close. My hospital, they were cited for being in violation of five state laws and 10 federal laws for unsanitary conditions in their operating rooms. It took me 10 years of almost weekly physical therapy to get back to a new normal life. I spent this past year, 2017, fighting for my life all over again. I went to the hospital with a sinus infection, and they said, OK, we're going to keep you because it looks like you're starting to be in the early stages of sepsis. Well, the next morning, the infectious disease doctor came, and he said, oh, great news. We're going to send you home. And I said, really? And he said, you know my history. I said, I'm a survivor of sepsis, pseudomonas, MRSA, VRE, and necrotizing fasciitis. Can we wait until my labs come back before you discharge me? And, you know, I'd like to see what some of the cultures are saying. And he goes, oh, we didn't, we didn't do any cultures. We don't need that. And, you know, we did a test for pneumonia and influenza, and you're fine. You don't have those. So we're going to go ahead and let you go home. And I said, well, can I get a second opinion on that? Can we talk to someone about that? And he said, I'm the best infectious disease doctor in the Valley, probably the state. Any other doctor is going to tell you the same thing I'm telling you. I ended up having two more surgeries, two more blood transfusions, deep vein thrombosis, blood clots in both arms. I was right back where I was five years before. And it just, it really cemented for me the need to change the way we teach doctors, the way we treat doctors, the way they interact with patients and patients interact with them. We need to start sharing patient experience with our medical students, with our nursing students, so that they can get it from the horse's mouth. When you're building your, your house, your profession, you want to make sure that you build it on a solid foundation of patient safety. It's a major reason why we've seen 50,000 fewer preventable patient deaths in hospitals. And if you want to know what that means, ask uh, Alicia Cole, who suffers the long-term effects of a hospital-acquired infection. You know, we've learned a lot in healthcare, and we're better than we were 10 years ago. We're doing great at talking about patient-centered care. We're doing great at talking about preventing errors. We've got to do better in the action of it. Oh, Alicia, thank you for sharing your continuing story. We appreciate your bravery and your resilience. You are a survivor and I applaud you. 
When I was 31, it took me six months to get diagnosed with breast cancer. I had to beg, plead, and negotiate with my general practitioner and the insurance company to get proactive care. The GP kept telling me it was nothing, I was too young, and since I had no family history, I should just get on with my life. Had I listened to him, I wouldn't be here with you today. Being a survivor of misdiagnosis made me become an advocate for my own care and for those I love. Hi, I'm Alicia Cole, and I'm a survivor of sepsis, pseudomonas, MRSA, VRE, and necrotizing fasciitis. I'm actually a two-time survivor of sepsis and necrotizing fasciitis following medical care. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for participating today. Thank you for joining us for World Patient Safety Day. Thank you for joining in our campaign to unite for safe care. If you're here to join us in our campaign for safe care, it means that you care about patients. It means that you care about your family, that you care about healthcare providers. It means that you care about yourself and your community. And I thank you. After surviving medical harm, you have weeks of recovery at best, months if you're lucky, years if you're fortunate. And some of us, it's a lifetime journey. Unfortunately, making it out of the hospital is just the first step. Well, I feel very fortunate to have survived medical harm. There are a lot of people that can't be with us today or can't speak like I am speaking to you today because of the medical harm. Um, it's an honor for me to be here and be able to share my story so that other people don't have to experience what I've been through. So the key word is I'm fortunate and I survived. Jack and Teresa Gentry are two of my heroes. After Jack suffered a catastrophic, life-changing event, the Gentrys feared they would receive the same deny, lie, and defend tactics Steve and Margot Burroughs received after their mother, Judy, was harmed. However, the hospital where Jack was harmed immediately implemented an open and honest approach known as CANDOR, which stands for Communication and Optimal Resolution. Jack and Teresa were so impressed with how they were treated, they have been presenting to healthcare systems across the country, sharing their story and why every hospital needs to implement the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Safety's CANDOR Toolkit. Full transparency with open and honest communication after preventable medical harm is not only the right thing to do, but it is also the smart thing to do. Please join me in welcoming my good friends, Jack and Teresa Gentry. As a survivor of medical harm, um, for me personally, it just, um, it took me down a different path in life that I had no expectations prior to the, um, the incident of traveling. And um, it made me aware that there are, I'm not alone um, as a survivor. And it made me aware of the hundreds of thousands of people who die from preventable medical errors. So it just, it just changed where I was going in life. I'm most proud of the fact that I've had the been afforded the opportunity to both locally and nationally take the message of the importance of dealing with patient safety and transparency to other hospital administrators and insurance companies and pharmacists um, of the how difficult it is to um, be a victim of a med a preventable medical harm. And I'm proud of the fact that um, I've been able to take that message around the country and hopefully um, have impacted um, some of the folks that uh, I've spoken to. 
And I think one of the things that I'm proud of is that we have been able to make our lives successful and fulfilling after medical harm, including our family, our friends, and all the people we've met. And it's been interesting, the work we do, being able to change just one person's outcome by spreading the word about medical error and or transparency in healthcare is one of the greatest rewards. I know we feel very thankful when we hear back that something like that has really had a positive effect. Thank you, Jack and Teresa. You're an inspiration. We need hope. We need inspiration now. We need a plan for change. We need a way to provide safer care for everyone. Don't we all deserve that? Help us make impactful change. In this world, 
We're just beginning to understand the miracle of living. I was afraid before, but I'm not afraid anymore. Ooh, baby, do you know what that's worth? Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. They say. pleasure to introduce my good friend and mentor, Joe Chiani, the founder and visionary of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Joe and his wife, Sarah, have dedicated their lives to making care safer for all patients. Please join me in welcoming Joe Chiani. I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. That's going to be our closing speaker. Uh, for this incredible three-hour session that we've had with you today to remind everybody about patient safety and how we can do something about uh, medical errors not becoming fatal. I first got inspired by President Clinton and his work through uh, the work at CGI, Clinton Global Initiative. It was incredible to see how he was able to bring so many people together, solving so many problems, from big problems to small problems. You know, he always talks about, it's better that we speak from the power of example than the example of our power. Well, he certainly did that. By working really hard, even after his presidency was over, in caring for other people's problems. He inspired many, many, many people to do the same. And it inspired me to do what I could do in helping people. I remember being on a trip with him and several other delegates through Africa looking at the great work they had done in places like Rwanda, Uganda, South Africa helping bring cancer hospitals in the middle of nowhere for cancer patients to helping people with small farms. One of the nights when we went back to our hotel and uh, had dinner together, after dinner, I told President Clinton about this problem that our industry knows so well that most of the world did not know about, which is how medical errors are the third leading cause of death in our country. When I told him a number, he was shocked. 
He came to me the next day saying, Joe, I've been thinking about the numbers you told me. That's more people than we lost in Korean War and Vietnam War combined. He said, if you go do something about it, I promise to help you with it. And I did, and he did. And if it wasn't for President Clinton, I don't think we would have had the patient safety movement. We may have had one summit, but we wouldn't have the patient safety movement. His power to convene helped me to convene the brightest minds from around the globe, passionate people from all walks, especially patient advocates that we hold near and dear to our hearts. And the movement began. For eight years in a row, President Clinton flew to California from wherever he was to deliver our keynote speech. And I'm grateful to him, we're all grateful to him for helping inspire this movement and helping create this movement. So without further ado, President William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you, Joe. And thanks to all of you who've joined us from around the world. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Tedros, leader of the World Health Organization, a longtime friend and one of the most capable public servants I've ever worked with. The WHO has been a vital partner to the Clinton Foundation in our work to lower the treatment costs for HIV AIDS in developing countries and in many other areas. And I thank Chai for working with the WHO to help deal with COVID and the WHO for honoring Chai with that responsibility. I'm grateful that you keep asking me back because the creation of the patient safety movement holds a special place in my heart. It was first announced at the Clinton Global Initiative annual meeting eight years ago. The work you've done since is extraordinary. And if anything, we've learned in the last year that it's more important than ever. Since 2012, you saved more than 366,000 patient lives, 93,000 in 2019 alone. Last year, 92 health technology companies signed an open data pledge to share data from their devices to improve interoperability and to save lives. And you gained 94 new partners from the nonprofit, academic, advocacy, and other sectors to continue to the work you do. I'm deeply grateful, finally, to the nearly 4,800 hospitals in 48 countries that have committed to implementing the Foundation's actionable patient safety solutions, which will help bring preventable patient deaths down to zero. All these numbers are moving in the right direction. The patient safety movement began with an audaciously ambitious target of zero preventable patient deaths by 2020. You have made wonderful progress toward that goal, and we all know there's more work to be done. So I want to encourage you as you continue your efforts toward a new goal of zero preventable patient deaths by 2030. Continue with a renewed sense of urgency. The United States is closing in on 200,000 people who will soon have died due to complications from the coronavirus. Many of them healthcare workers themselves. It's safe to assume that many people who never considered the issue of patient safety before 2020 are devastatingly aware of it now. This is not simply an academic issue anymore. It never has been. It's deeply human and personal to all the people who've lost loved ones. Preventable patient deaths can be the result of any number of causes, flawed systems, technology, human error. You can argue about how many of the COVID deaths were preventable, and it'll be years before the full picture emerges with any kind of consensus, if it ever does. But we can all agree that the, pand that the pandemic has exposed to a tremendous degree deep systematic shortcomings in our national healthcare system and its preparedness to deal with the pandemic. It's also had a disproportionate impact on low-income populations and communities of color. In the spring, we watched as hospitals became overwhelmed with COVID patients, and doctors and nurses tried to figure out how to effectively treat them, even as they faced critical supply shortages and dealt with a new and rapidly evolving illness hardly anyone knew anything about. Healthcare professionals have been rightfully lauded as heroes 
for their efforts responding to these challenges. But we have to do more. We need policies and processes in place to address the shortcomings that lead to preventable deaths. One thing I've always appreciated about the patient safety, safety movement is that it examines systematic failures without looking to assign blame. Its mission is to unite stakeholders from different areas of the healthcare landscape, from patients to clinicians, to hospital administrators, to equipment manufacturers, to policy makers, many of whom might otherwise find themselves disagreeing with one another, so that we can have an honest, productive conversation about ways to make the healthcare system better and safer for everyone. I said before, this organization is a poster child for how the world should operate. It's still the truth. I'll just give you an example from our work at the Clinton Foundation. I thought we could help address the major opioid crisis in America by driving down the cost of life-saving overdose medication, naloxone, and increasing its availability. Our opioid response network has made naloxone accessible at no cost to colleges, high schools, community-based organizations. We've also taken a regional approach with the network and partnered with local faith leaders and communities across several states to address the unique challenges their cities are facing. In the case of COVID-19, we know the infections in people with underlying conditions are more likely to be fatal. In 2005, my foundation joined with the American Heart Association to found the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, which works to reduce the prevalence of childhood obesity and to empower kids to develop lifelong healthy habits. We've worked with the American Beverage Association to reduce the amount of sugary drinks in school vending machines by 90%. We've partnered with McDonald's to offer more balanced Happy Meal menu options in America and the UK. Our Healthy Schools program supports more than 20 million students by improving physical education, health education, child nutrition, and stealth wellness policies in nearly 35,000 schools. I could go on, but you get the idea. All of the results were achieved with a partnership approach. We're living in a time of great uncertainty. We're facing some of the most pressing challenges the world has ever known. But these problems are made worse by our growing division and our sense of exclusive tribalism. It's also true in the healthcare system that misinformation that's allowed to proliferate and spread on social media and other online platforms, born in part of skepticism of established norms and widened by partisan divides. Still, the patient safety movement makes me optimistic because you and your partners are rising to those challenges. You're working to solve problems in the best way possible agree on the end, and then work through cooperation with a shared belief that every person should have access to high-quality, safe care. So keep going. Keep bringing in new partners. Keep coming to the table together to save lives and fulfill that promise of zero preventable deaths. Thank you. Today has been an educational and inspirational day. It has been such an honor to have so many brave family members and survivors join us and share their stories with us. As we begin to close, I'd like to highlight that in the week leading up to today, World Patient Safety Day, there have been dozens of organizations taking action in a multitude of ways. Let's take a look at a short video we've put together with footage from World Patient Safety Day activities around the globe. We plan on sharing more events that we weren't able to fit into this video on our social media. So if you don't follow us, be sure to click the link in the description below so you can continue to see how all of our partners around the world have spent their World Patient Safety Day. Let's check it out.
Thank you for joining us today for Unite for Safe Care. Thanks to all of you and your generous support, we've been able to raise important funds to support medical education and community outreach programs for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, preventing patient harm in hospitals and healthcare systems around the globe. Some solutions are complex, some are very simple, such as good hand washing. Partnering with 4,793 committed hospitals across 48 countries, our free healthcare improvement programs on independent audit has helped over, save over 93,276 lives last year and over 366,353 lives since our inception in 2012. And this is all from independent audit. These are not our figures. We're encouraged by these lives that have been saved as it demonstrates that solutions are out there. We just need to implement them. We all need to have our hospitals as really good healthcare organizations that are safe for our patients to enter. They all need to be high reliability organizations, just like our important areas like nuclear power. What could be more important than the hospitals that our patients go to? So we will get there. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Lauren Rayner, our Chief Development Officer for the Foundation. Lauren? Thank you, Mike. We are so pleased that you were all able to join us today. The donations we raise help to advance our mission, education programs, and advocacy work to improve patient safety. Funding will also save lives and give us the capacity to build new resources and solutions that will positively impact healthcare organizations globally. Join us today by making a donation. You can text UFSC to 44321 or use the donate link on this page. Every dollar you donate gets us closer to eliminating preventable patient harm and death. We appreciate your support and investment in our mission. We also want to thank our generous sponsors, 10th Dot, Jewish Healthcare Foundation, Josie King Foundation, Kaiser Permanente, Larmark, Massimo, Medtronic, Mind Matters PAC, MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety, RL Datex, Smart Patients, and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Thank you to all of our wonderful volunteers who have worked tirelessly to ensure our program was a success. We could have not done this without you. Mike, back to you in closing our program. We appreciate your participation in our programming. It's been amazing to see how many people have joined us during this campaign over the last 10 days, helping to bring awareness to patient and health worker safety. We'd hope to gather in thousands in person today, but instead we've gathered in thousands virtually. We look forward to the time when we can all gather together again in person, safely for a big demonstration and a march for patient safety to celebrate this, the second World Patient Safety Day. World Patient Safety Day doesn't stop today. We still have work to do if we plan to get to zero preventable deaths by 2030 but we can do it. With all your help, your enthusiasm, your assistance, we can get there and we can prevent preventable harm as well and so that everywhere that we have healthcare is safe. We can go to those hospitals and know that the chance of an error is incredibly small. So we hope that you'll continue to follow our work and support us and get involved with the organization the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Thank you for all our speakers and performers. We appreciate your participation in our program. Thank you for joining us in uniting for safe care. Thank you all. Hospitals are still the most dangerous places on earth. And you look at during the pandemic, they're dangerous not just for patients, they're dangerous for staff. They've been dangerous for staff and patients for a long time. There's violence against healthcare professionals and there's violence against patients in the form of medical 
errors that are preventable. We were in crisis prior to COVID in the healthcare system. So now we are asked as healthcare workers to go into a now war zone. Staff safety and patient safety are two sides of the same coin. And that's why in this pandemic year, more than ever, we need to unite for safe care. None of us go into healthcare to harm patients. We choose medicine so we could heal and support those in need. Like other high-risk industries, we need to find solutions that trap these errors before they cause harm to our patients. To unite for safe care means to speak up. It means to say what we know so that we can begin to count these errors and these harms with each other, no matter what role we have to play in that medical delivery of care or that medical receiving of care. We're all patients at one time or another, and we all rely on the care provided to us by healthcare workers across the world. Too often it feels like we're on opposing teams or teams with opposing agendas, but in fact, there's only one agenda, and that is to help the patient get better. Culture is essential, and it serves as a solid foundation to build process improvement projects on top of to be successful. One of the issues that we really need to take on if we're ever going to achieve health equity and eliminate disparities is take a, a honest, courageous look at structural and institutional bias uh, and racism that has been part and parcel of healthcare delivery and clinical decision making far too long. We have to build that trust back in healthcare. We have to be able to trust that no matter what color we are, what ethnicity we are, we will come through that procedure or that treatment better than we did when we went in. But what we don't want is to come out worse and harmed. That should be a standard for all of us in this country and we know how to do it. We just have to come together and we have to shine a light on the problem, address it with all the candor that we can find in our hearts and work together to improve it. So this Unite for Safe Care campaign is something that each and every one of us can be a part of, can participate in, can learn from, and we can share our experiences in how to make healthcare safer. I am proud to represent this movement that has the potential to improve our lives immensely. Unite for Safe Care represents to me hope, health, and happiness. So we can do this, we need to do this. We've been working with legislators to align the incentives and increase transparency. During this pandemic is our time to step up and say we're going to do better for our patients and for each other starting today. So keep going, keep bringing in new partners. Keep coming to the table together to save lives and fulfill that promise of zero preventable deaths.